Well, they're resolving an issue so that we can hear one of the zoning board members. I'm going to do a call to order. So um, welcome everyone to the zoning board of adjustment meeting for December 21st. It is 7.05 p.m. Our apologies for starting late. Um, we're going to start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. Those of you who would like to participate, please do. And then we're going to um, move to a quick discussion on continuance, which may clear some of you from the room at this time, if the board should choose to hear that continuance. So I'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it is, the nation under God, Thank you. Vanessa, can you hear me now? I'm going to ask, I know you can hear me and we can't hear you yet. So I'm going to ask that your roll call vote be a nod of your head. Present remotely is Paul Thibodeau. Yep. Thank you, sir. Andre, thank you. Bro. Thank you. Here. Oh, George Bailey here. And Tracy oh. Hardikoff here. <clears throat> I'd like to ask the Zoning board at this time for two things. I'd like to move the agenda with your permission. Um, I'd like to move meeting minutes up um, right after the Pledge of Allegiance and then a continuance request. Do I have a motion? Um, so moved. And a second. second. Okay. And all those in favor of changing that portion Aye. of the agenda? Aye. Paul, did you hear that? Could you nod yes if you're in? A, okay, very good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> American Sign Language would come and help <laughs> right at this moment. Um, so the first thing is review of the meeting minutes. Uh, I've reviewed them. I did not find them to be anything but complete. I found no spelling errors. I would make a motion to accept those meeting minutes. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Cheryl Huckins. Thank you so much. All those in favor, Paul, I'll take a nod uh, of your head. Yes. If you I, agree to accept yeah. the meeting minutes. I have to abstain. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Aye. Aye. The meeting minutes are accepted from the prior months. Uh, actually, it's two months about this meeting. The next thing before us is a request for. Did I get this right? For 240-8GR-22-3 variance and special exception. This is in reference to the Young Road applicant. They have asked for a continuance. Um, I know that our zoning board member has asked to recuse himself from any and all things regarding a vote on this. So do I have a motion for a continuance to January on that case? I'll make a motion. And do I have a second? Andre is a second. Thank you. All those in favor of continuing that case to the January 19th meeting? Have I got the correct right? Um, Jen, I'm going to say 18th. <clears throat> yeah, 18th. Okay. The 18th, January 18th meeting. So do I have a motion to move that, continue it without additional fees for that applicant? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of continuing that to January? Yes. Yes. Bailey, aye. Hardikoff, aye. Thank you so much, folks. Okay. So if anyone is here to hear the Young Road case, we have moved it to the month of January. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We did notice online that this was going to be a potential right to no vote. So my apologies, everyone. Hey, Paul, if you can hear me, can you unmute yourself and see if we can hear you now? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, I see you all unmuted. Just give me one second. I'll check you to try again. Okay, so moving on, folks. I'm going to ask that everyone do me the favor, place your phones either on vibrate or silent so that we do not interrupt any portion of the meeting. Thank you. Okay. All right, try that box. Done? Just. Test. I we, oh, excellent. We yeah. hear you, sir. You hear me. Hallelujah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. We're, we're about to start the first. Um... Yep. Very good. Thank you. Um, we had a roll call vote. You signified by nodding your head. We feel comfortable with that. Thank you. Our first public hearing is in reference to 244-1GR-22, a variance. The owners are Fixed Homes, LLC. It is a request by the applicant for a variance from Article 4, Section 4.1.1, Table 2, Dimensional Standards, 
to allow fronting on 33.6 feet where 40 feet is required at 65 Corbett Road on a two acre lot in the general residential zoning district. After? Madam Chair? Speech? Yes. I'll have to recuse myself from this uh, application. Excellent. Um, that, um, I'm going to pause for a quick minute. Would the board entertain me describing what our job is as a zoning board of administration? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, and Kartikoff, I, I'm very comfortable with that as well. I'm always open to learning something. Excellent. Else. So we've all taken training um, to sit on this ZBA as a land use board. And I wanted to just bring up the fact we are a quasi judicial board, and that is um, by appointment of the select board. And our job is to listen to special exceptions to zoning ordinances that everyone in the town votes on and to listen to variances, relax, relaxation of some rules or waivers that are provided to people where they own a piece of property that they would like to be able to use. But in its current condition or state, there are zoning ordinances in place that would not allow them to use the property. That is why we exist. There were a few things posted online. I want to just be very clear with people. Because someone sits on the ZBA does not mean that they cannot apply for either special exception, variance, or administrative appeal. They have the right to do that as a resident of the town of Barrington. We do, however, take an oath before we sit in front of you, and we hold that oath very tight in that we will function ethically with every case that we hear before us. So I would just ask from a public perspective, our job is not to stop growth in the town of Barrington. Our job is not to do a favor for a friend. That is not what we're here for. We're here to still represent the best interest of all of the town of Barrington, but as a quasi judicial board to hear those special exceptions that are needed and any variances that need to be put forth or appeals for administrative decision that need to be overturned in order for someone to appropriately use a piece of land. So I, I brought that forward because um, I personally read online quite a few comments questioning how the board could function with ethics and still hear a case from someone that might sit on the board. I feel very comfortable that we can do that. Oh, um, absolutely. Do the rest of you feel comfortable with that as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. Very good. Thank you. OK, so with this particular request for 244-1-GR-22, the variance for owners fixed homes, a couple of things I need to bring forward. Our legal department indicated you are actually asking for a change to the front setback. Have I got that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what they needed. Yeah. But the request in the notice that went out was for frontage, which is different than a front setback. So if you choose to have the board hear this, just understand that the notice reads one thing. Should someone appeal our decision, we will have to rehear your case in January. Or you can wait until January. I have to leave that up to you to decide. I've discussed that with my client and we are prepared to move forward. Uh, okay. Although so, I, I don't necessarily know it would be an automatic reversal, but we could that would be a conversation for a different day. I'm, I'm letting you know how legal has guided us. We're letting you make the decision. Sure. You're comfortable proceeding. We are comfortable proceeding. Very good. Okay. So in the public hearing, we hear the case for it and then anyone who would like to speak against it. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is Brett Allard with Shaughnessy Raish. I am legal counsel for the applicant uh, in this matter, uh, Fixed Homes LLC, who is the property owner, and joined with me to my right is the principal of that LLC, Luke Stillwagon. Uh, this is 65 Corbett Road, tax parcel 2241 in the general residential district. Uh, the property is approximately two acres uh, and has 300 feet or so of frontage on Corbett Road. Um, I do have um, extra copies of the foundation certificate in case anyone needs them, but I think they were included in your. your they were. Yeah. Okay. Um, this site is uh, is serviced by a private well uh, and septic. Um, it does have some pretty steep slopes in the front, 
as well as in the back of the lot, there was some photos attached to the application. Mm -hmm. I believe the board has those in its packet as well, um, which show the sort of steep slope in the front uh, of the lot in that front yard setback um, in between the road slash right of way um, and, and the home. Um, it also has sort of a steep slope in the back as well, which is, is not quite as relevant to what we're going to be discussing tonight. Mm -hmm. um, the, so the site does sit substantially above grade from the road. Uh, if you if you look at it uh, from that perspective. There's a narrow sort of wetland channel that bisects the property, so we have dry upland in the front by Corbett Road, and we have dry upland in the back, but you do see on the plan that there is that section of wetlands that sort of cuts the property in half. So um, if you look at the wetland setback, which is 50 feet, uh, combined with the 30 foot side setback and 40 foot front yard setback, you mm -hmm. get an extraordinarily small building envelope, uh, which is essentially that little triangle for lack of a better geographic mm -hmm. geometric shape uh, mm -hmm. in the northeast corner of the lots. Um, my client bought this property in January of this year. Uh, the property historically maintained a um, sort of dilapidated manufactured home, which is shown on that plan. Um, that manufactured home as you see on the plan was almost entirely within the 50 foot fit, excuse me 50 foot uh, wetland setback um, and it was 22 point 22 29.2 feet from the edge of the wetland at its closest point uh, on that southwest corner uh, since my client purchased the property uh, that manufactured home has been removed actually it was removed by the prior owner um, my client obtained a building permit to build a new single family home in the location that you see on the plan. Um, and the intended location of the home was entirely within that uh, very small, uh, but, but still adequate for purposes of the size of the home building envelope. Um, so it was intended to go entirely within that building envelope. The setbacks were measured uh, by a surveyor that my client retained back in the spring of this year. Um, and stakes were placed by the surveyor at that time on the corners of the proposed uh, new home. Surveyor's name, please. Fred Jewell. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the surveyor was scheduled to return in June. There was a delay. Uh, my client ended up engaging a different surveyor to come out and complete the field certificate. Uh, uh, foundation certificate that we have submitted that was done by Eric Salovich at Northam survey um, and at that time uh, it was discovered that the uh, field certificate plan showed that the building wasn't placed in precisely the correct location um, the intended foundation had shifted about six and a half feet in between the time when the stakes were placed marking the corners of the new home and when the foundation footings were poured um, and essentially what we think happened is the stakes were removed by the original excavator when he was digging the hole to build the foundation and uh, then the hole got dug and there was a misfire by six months. Um, that issue was discovered in October um, of this year. It was an honest mistake, uh, certainly nothing intentional or nefarious. Um, and we actually had a good conversation uh, recently with my client talking about, you know, I think next time what we could do is double stake it. Mm -hmm. So you have your stakes to mark the corners and then do maybe 20 feet from each stake so that if the initial stakes have to be removed, you still have sort of the tie lines if that's the right surveying word, um, where you can measure and put those stakes back in so you can sort of double check along the way. Uh, but be that as it may, we are here where we are today. The foundation has been poured and the house has been built. Um, and so as soon as we uh, received the uh, foundation certificate, uh, my client immediately contacted the town to say, hey, you know, this is a problem. I just discovered it. What can we do to resolve it? Uh, and here we are. Um, so we are requesting a variance from um, <clears throat> Article 4.1.1, Table 2, to allow the new dwelling to remain 33.6 feet from the front lot line. Uh, where the ordinance does require a 40 foot front yard setback. So without further ado, the five variance criteria um, granting the variance will not be contrary to the public interest. 
Uh, for a variance to be contrary to the public interest, the proposal has to unduly and a marked degree conflict with the ordinance so much that it violates basic zoning objectives. Uh, and the relevant tests are whether the proposal will alter the character of the area or uh, threaten public health and welfare or safety. We don't see any alteration to the essential character of the area if the variance is granted. Uh, this property will remain consistent with the single family nature of the, uh, the neighborhood. Um, and in fact, several other properties in the area do have structures which currently encroach into the front yard setback. Just two of them that I could find based on the town's GIS system are 38 Corbett Road. It has a structure 28 feet from the front lot line, 71 Corbett Road. Has two structures. I think one's a garage and one's a home, but one's six feet from the front lot line uh, and one's 23 feet. Those are probably grandfathered structures if I had to guess, but consistent with the character of the area nonetheless. Um, we don't think there's any threat to the public health or safety. Uh, we'll still have 33.6 feet between the home and the front lot line, uh, and that's just to the edge of the right of way. It's actually an additional 20 feet to the edge of pavement. So if we're talking structure to pavement, we have about 53 feet. Um, again, the site is substantially above grade from the road. Uh, so that slope that you see in those photos, uh, and if you're driven by the site, really forms a sort of natural uh, sloping buffer in between the buildable upland and the road. So we're not going to have a situation where there's any danger to motorists or any interference with snow plowing and road maintenance or anything like that. Number two, granting the variance will be consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. Uh, the spirit of front yard setbacks is really to minimize overcrowding, congested development, uh, and provide a buffer between structures and motorists traveling on the roadway and ensure uh, sufficient area for snow removal and road maintenance, as I suggested. As I just said, we don't see any of those as issues here. Uh, we don't think there'll be any overcrowding. We have enough upland to support the dwelling, uh, even with the 6.5 foot misfire, so to speak. Um, the new home is almost entirely within the building envelope and even more so than the um, prior uh, mobile home, uh, at least relative to that wetland setback. So we think the spirit of the ordinance is observed. Number three, granting the variance would do substantial justice. Uh, the courts held that perhaps the only guiding rule is that any loss to the applicant that is not outweighed by a gain to the general public is an injustice. Uh, and I think that's the most really critical criteria here for this type of application. I don't say that for every application, but I think it's the most important one here um, because the ZBA can grant a variance to pardon sort of an honest mistake like this when it happens. Uh, it doesn't set precedent. You know, the board can still analyze future situations on a case by case basis, but here there was nothing intentional. There was nothing nefarious. Um, I'm sure my client wishes it didn't happen and he wasn't going to sit here tonight. Um, <laughs> certainly not gaining anything uh, by that he would have otherwise had with this property had it been built in the right location. It's not a situation where it's, you know, oh, let's accidentally build it further to the front and then we can build something else in the back. It's not the house is there. It's the same house that was going to be there regardless. Uh, it was just an honest mistake that happened. Um, which is now costing time and money to resolve, and we're hopeful we can resolve, resolve it tonight. But um, that is to say that there's no injury to the public if the variance is granted. There's really only harm to my client if the variance is denied um, in terms of extraordinary costs if he had to tear down the house and move the foundation six and a half feet. We actually talked about what the cost would be, and it would be to the tune of 450000 based on current investment. and. Um, additional money that would be, have to be spent to accomplish that sort of thing uh, for six and a half feet. Uh, so we think for those reasons, substantial justice would certainly be done uh, by granting the variance. And this, you know, the house is appropriate for the area. Uh, it's consistent with the present use of the area. <laughs> we think uh, when you weigh the public and private rights, substantial justice really is uh, in the way of granting this variance. Number four, the values of uh, surrounding properties will not be diminished. Um, the proposal is in harmony with the neighborhood. Uh, it is proposed to use single family residential, which is permitted by right in the neighborhood in the zone. Uh, doesn't it's presumed that reasonable permitted uses don't devalue surrounding property values. Uh, this property is being revitalized based on what was there before and what's being you know putting there now. Uh, we're not seeking to build within any side setbacks closer to neighbors than is otherwise allowed. So uh, we do think that. Uh, granting a variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. And 
Last but not least, unnecessary hardship. I know the board knows the standard, so I won't read it, but suffice to say, so special conditions is the first part of the analysis. Uh, and we think we have several special conditions here that distinguish this property from others in the area. First is that wetland. Uh, that really is what creates the sort of pinch in the corner there. Uh, the second is those steep slopes in the front, the steep slopes in the back, and then when you combine the wetland setback, the side setback, and the front yard setback, again, you get that extraordinarily small building envelope in combination with the fact that this site does sit well above grade uh, from the, the roadway. So owing to all those special conditions, we don't believe there's a fair and substantial relationship between the purpose and application of the front yard setback uh, requirement here. Um, again, the primary purpose is to minimize overcrowding and congested development and make sure you're not going to have any dangers in terms of building too close to the road. No overcrowding. So we got sufficient upland. The new home is almost entirely within the building envelope. No plowing, road maintenance issues because, again, that slope and the significant distance uh, and the substantial grade. Um, so really the purpose and the harms that the zoning ordinance seeks to protect or, or prevent are not threatened here if the variance is granted. So for all of those reasons, and because it is again a permitted by right use, we believe the proposed use is reasonable, uh, and we'd ask that the uh, board grant the variance. We'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll just make an observation. I, I did approach the land use department to ask, had there ever been another building by this particular builder that was placed in the wrong? Um, location at the time of the foundation was poured, and the answer we received was no. So thank you um, for that. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. No. Okay. I'm sorry. Any other no. questions? No. Paul, you're online. Do you have any other questions? Paul recused himself. From oh, this. Paul recused himself. Thank you very much. Um, seeing as that portion of those speaking for um, has been completed, is there anyone who'd like to speak against this application? Yes, sir. I'm not sure. Uh, did you have any questions on that? No. no. Okay. Is there anyone who would like to speak against this particular application? Here, so if anybody would like to have for the variance. If there's anybody online, if you could raise your hand, um, so that way you, we know that you would like to speak for or against this, um, and then you can unmute yourself. Can you raise your hand by mousing over your screen, and it will pull up nice little hand. You can click on that and we'll hear you and recognize you if you're there to speak against this application. And star six can unmute yourself if you're on the phone. If you're on the phone. I don't see anybody. No reaction. Okay. Um, seeing as we've heard all testimony uh, in reference to this application, would anyone like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we grant this variance. Um, my reasoning is. I believe this was an honest mistake in six and a half weeks. I think we'd be unreasonable to expect him to rip up his house and his funding for number six and a half weeks. And I, I, make a, I make a motion that we grant this. Second that, and I'll second that for the same reasons. I feel that uh, just a human error. Okay. Uh, could I have a roll call vote, please, beginning with Mr. Yeah. Aye. Article five. Thank you very much. Oh, can I also put in a note? Right, step back. Yes. Yes. I think I can um, um, open the meeting with enough detail on that that we addressed. Yeah. We addressed by legal issues. So I'm going to. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Next before us is 251-9-GR-22, an application for special exception. Is there anyone here to speak on behalf of that? Tyler, Tyler and King Brandon. Okay. Mr. Rand, before you begin, I'm not even going to have you place that because um, I think after speaking with our legal department that you're going to need to withdraw the special exception application and the plan of variance for this use. Okay. And okay. if we were to proceed, we would run into the same situation that we just proposed, but I think with a much more 
maybe um, passionate group of people speaking in reference to it. So I would give you the word that our legal department has recommended that you withdraw the special exception application and apply for a variance for next use. Could you say that again, please? Sure. Our legal department has recommended that you withdraw your application for a special exception and apply for a variance for mixed use. I have with me uh, five applications for a variance for mixed use with me here now. Okay. We have to legally notice the public when we are hearing any of the cases. We would not be charging you to pre-file. It okay. would be at no cost, but our legal department has recommended that course of action so that we're appropriately addressing your case. Okay. Is there anything you should, can say now or you want to hear now? Answer any question. So um, our recommendations were that you withdraw and reapply under the variance for the mixed use. Okay. Wish I had a different answer for you. <laughs> I know that you did a lot of prep. Okay. Anything we would decide tonight mm -hmm. would be appealable almost instantly. Okay. Okay. May we have it from you verbally, sir, <laughs> if that is your wish. I wish to apply correctly for what I need to. Variance. Yes. And if it's a variance, that's what I desire. If it's a, I guess I'm at the point where I'm not even sure if it's supposed to be a variance or a special condition. Oh. I think in this case it has been in a special condition in the past. Mm -hmm. And so are am I hearing accurately that 100 percent that this needs to be a variance? Yes, that is what our legal representative for the town of Barrington has advised us. So am I stating that correctly? Yes. So um when the applicant came in for um to apply for mixed use that whole advisement was a special exception to the use of the property, but a variance is more appropriate for his. For the full application that was the No, this is completely okay. up to the applicant. Right. And, um, and then per our like, definition, John is like, no, um, definition of That's what we have had conflicting thoughts with the attorney official originally about like why is it special that's a number of reviews and is what we based it on the definition that's in our zone mm -hmm. yeah because it talks about use Yes. And he was asking for a use, a mm -hmm. uh, setback and stuff like that. And we should be looking at those issues as being variants and then you should be in a special exception because how this is written. Mm -hmm. I don't know what mm -hmm. with what the agent mm -hmm. is told about. Mm -hmm. That's why we're trying to let time. We're we'll taking responsibility to kind of give it in the wrong direction based on our definition. Based on definition. Okay. okay. So any of the refiling fees and the notice to the abundance for next month for Mrs. Refile will be waived. Could I have a motion to waive all fees for the so Second and a second. And could I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Yes. Haley, aye. Hardikoff, aye. Mr. Thibodeau? Aye. aye. Thank you. So all fees would be refiled okay. in a you. more appropriate manner and all fees would be waived. Okay. Thank okay. you. So there's no no question. It's going to be a variance. That's going to be a variance. That this is what our legal department tells us. Nope. That is how we proceed. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your time. Any, any, any questions for me? No. No. Um, if you re resubmit as a variance, you can be heard January 18th. Okay. So I mean, I can take your application number two if you. I will. Okay. Make sure that it's accurate. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you. Next up, public hearing of the application 239-7-PC-22, a variance owner's town center property request by the applicant for a variance to Article 19, Table 1, Table of Uses, Footnote 15, to allow for a total of 62 bedrooms where 29 are permitted. Request for a variance to Article 60. Section 16.3.2, parenthesis 2, and 16.3.2, parenthesis 3. And from Article 19, Table 1, Table of Uses, Footnote 6, to allow for a total of 32 units where seven are permitted on the Hill Highway, Malibu Road, on 12.05 acres in the Town Center Zoning District. Presented by a Francis, am I pronouncing this right, Bruton? Very good. Very good. Just, just. Before we get started, if you could take that and sort it over by the podium, you can have it so the people there can see it, plus it will be seen by the helpers. Yeah, the people can see it, but the cameras don't pick it up. Where do you want to place it? If they go over here, it's a podium. Because they can angle it. And we have copies of this. So that way, the people on the camera can see what they're pointing to, what they point to, and the people in the audience can too. I can't tell you how to present your case, but I will say you're asking for four variances. So going uh, one by one, I think, would be the most appropriate way for us to digest all of the information. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Dan Gabriel. I'm 50% uh, owner of um, Town Center Properties, and my partner, Bud Meter, is here with us today. Um, and uh, we have um, We've, we've known each other for a long time, and we bought this property in 2015. Um, and I wanted to, I know that my lawyer gets very nervous for me to say something, especially without any script. <laughs> but I, it was important for me to share with you um, my passion for this project, because uh, since day one, um, it was important to me to do something for the elderly for the town of Barrington. Uh, my parents are both deceased, and when they needed assistance, there was no room at the end. Um, and what we're experiencing everywhere right now is that um, either staffing issues or uh, capacity issues, uh, many of the, the nursing homes and the care uh, for the elderly um, is closed for anybody new. and. It's causing a lot of uh, uh, burdens on families. So um, to just give a brief history, in 2007, uh, the town spent a lot of money on a vision plan. And we have a copy of this vision plan here. I don't know if everyone can see it, but um, you say you have a copy, so I'll, I'll go this way with it. Um, we were familiar with this plan and familiar with the town process. And we believe that our presentation um, conforms every aspect of this plan. And what we're asking for tonight is a density on the elderly because there is a disconnect between this plan and how the, um, the rules and density calculations have changed over the last couple of years. <clears throat> and um, I think FX will point out what those differences are. But back in 2007 or thereabouts, this plan was created, and what it showed was a town center, and that's when the uh, zoning was changed. And I think this also incorporates George Hill's property, as well as the Knight's property, as well as all the surrounding, even across the street where Irby is, so it's quite a large track. Um, on this plan, there were one, two, three, four, five, six senior housing uh, very large buildings being proposed, or at least in, in concept. Um, one of the buildings, which would be right next to the post office, was about four times the size of the post office. So this was the vision for the town. This is what um, a lot of the town business people that were on it, I think George was on it, I, uh, maybe Greg or uh, one of the Boltons were on it, but I know that there were at least a dozen people that uh, were involved in a, in a hearing committee about what uh, the town wants for this area. Um, and it included a town green or a common area, 
uh, it included in this case a ball field or recreation for um, for the public. And um, I think there's a library uh, written in right here. And and this was the, the this was the directive we had when we went to the town and said, and I met with the planning department and said, what do we what do we do with this piece of property? And they said, please try to stick to the plan. So um, uh, about that time, 2007, there was a company, I think their name was uh, Tropic Star Development, and they had proposed and went to the planning board with about six very large uh, commercial retail buildings. When I mean large, they were like six JC pennies. Um, in the middle was a large grocery store and parking was all along the, the strip of where the Knights are now. Um, and and that would have probably had a thousand cars a day. Um, it was a very, very large project. Then the recession hit in 2008. The project never got built. Um, the developer never purchased it from, from Mrs. Califf at the time. Uh, and then a number of years went by. And in 2015, actually almost to the day, I think it was sometime around the, the middle of December of 2015, I sat with Mrs. Caleb in her kitchen uh, with other family members and um, asked, you know, what are your thoughts? And she says, I really hope and my, my wishes is that something be provided for the Barrington residents so that the elderly can stay here, that they can live here. They don't have to move and go to another community. And I said, well, I'll make sure we'll incorporate that. So over the past seven years, I've been approached by um, one with a brewery that's an acceptable use in this zone. And I said, no. Um, another was a, uh, a large restaurant that actually had a nightclub attached to it, which could be approved in this zone. And I said, no, because I really wanted to do this elderly project. So over the last 12 months, I've been meeting um, with uh, the planning department and um, the town uh, the zoning administrator. And I believe we've come up with a plan uh, that makes sense. Um, I know that on social media, there have been a lot, of, a lot of writings about this. I'm not on social media, but people have sent me some of these posts. First, I want to clarify, it says a major developer is coming to Barrington. I'm not a major developer. I've been retired for a number of years. Um, the only property that Mr. Meter and I own together is this property, and we don't have any projects going on. Um, I haven't had employees for 15 years, so not a major developer. I am a person that's lived in Stratford County all my life, and I believe that there's a real need, and, and now is the time. And if you're going to ever have anything for the elderly, I think this is the place for it. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to FX, and I believe we have a, a, a professional uh, person that uh, specializes in geriatric care and that is also going to make a presentation. Thank you, Dan, and members of the board and Madam Chair. My name is FX Bruton. Um, it says Francis X Bruton, but I do go by FX, so you might hear that name. Um, I'm uh, an attorney with Bruton and Barabee in Dover, and um, I'm happy to be here and happy to be involved in this project. Uh, a little bit of background, um, we, uh, we did look at the uh, schematic design that was developed in 2007, and when you compare that uh, to uh, what we're proposing, you'll see a tremendous amount of similarities. Uh, Dan mentioned the senior housing that was on that plan. There's actually seven buildings of that that are depicted. Uh, Ballfield Town Green as part of this uh, project being a PUP or uh, planned unit development. Uh, we would uh, be working with the town to provide for uh, a rather large area for the town's use as they might see fit. And I think there's a lot of uh, interest and support and excitement by the town with respect to that possibility. Um, the uh, uh, the plan that we have, if you kind of did a flip of the two, you'd see pretty much it's a very similar project. Uh, the uh, the senior housing that's depicted 
Does it not limit it in a sense? Um, what we came up with was uh, a uh, uh, plan that incorporated the senior housing concept vis-a-vis -vis, uh, first um, um, an assisted living facility, um, which you see on the uh, current plan, and then a uh, independent living, we call it. Uh, what that is is a 55 and older uh, 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 place. Uh, what's interesting, and um, Mr. John Huckins, excuse me, yeah, oh, yes, John Huckins. John Hopkins is here, uh, and he is um, very well known for uh, owning and running uh, Bellamy Fields and Watson Fields, and he'll be speaking to you briefly tonight just to kind of give you his perspective on how these things operate. Uh, if there's opposition, which you might hear tonight, some of it might be related to traffic. Uh, he's going to talk about how, even though we have presented a plan that meets the uh, uh, required parking in terms of what would units require for parking. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, putting that into a little bit of context in terms of um, what happens at a uh, assisted living facility. Uh, and that is, in a sense, with respect to parking, uh, virtually almost 10% of what is required is what is used. And, and he'll speak to that in, in some terms, but uh, where we show the biggest building, uh, we show 124 spaces of parking for the assisted living facility. Um, we're going to probably use 10 to 12. So uh, that's one of those elements that I think um, you'll understand from uh, uh, Mr. Hopkins that that is the case. Uh, often when I go before planning boards or zoning boards, um, I talk about what I think might happen, and I think this board tries to understand what might happen. Um, he's going to talk about this in terms of real terms and what really does happen. So I think that's helpful to you so that you will have uh, a real account of how this uh, facility would work and um, kind of, again, keep that in context. What we also provided, again, was the 55 and older housing and part of what we expect to happen, and I think what Mr. Hopkins will also confirm is that uh, oftentimes couples of uh, people in Barrington who either want to downsize uh, find that uh, unfortunately one spouse might require a, a higher level of care, that being the um, assisted living care, where the other spouse wants to be next to that person. What a great opportunity for someone who can be in the independent care um, next to their spouse who is uh, being treated in the assisted living care. Uh, those kinds of things dovetail very well together, and that's why these buildings are situated the way they are. Uh, we're looking to create uh, 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 a significant amount of services, obviously, on the assisted care. Those services can be broadened so that those people who are in the 55 and older can take advantage of those, whether they're nutritional training, um, uh, meals, um, uh, other kinds of therapeutic care, things that will help them as well. So again, this seems to be a very integrated uh, project uh, on purpose. Uh, in addition, we have, as you know, uh, medical office um, um, suggested as well as a daycare. We expect about 10 employees to be rotating on uh, uh, shifts at the assisted uh, living facility. Those people are obviously potential customers, if you will, of the daycare. So that again diminishes the uh, parking or the traffic uh, that might be going in and out with that kind of use. And obviously a medical office to um, provide the services that certainly will be necessary for those in the assisted living. It really uh, creates uh, quite, a, quite a great mix in terms of uh, how this can uh, operate in an integrated way and how it fits right in with what the what the general intent was with respect to the um, to the uh, town center concept in the beginning again uh, other other properties are in that area and are zoned for other uses that that is also anticipated by uh, the town center uh, concept and and those businesses will support and be supported by this uh, development. So we're, we're we're looking, I think, at what really 
was the intent and what we're doing is we're kind of breathing life to it and we hope that you would agree that that's the case <coughs> as a result of how the uh, zoning what uh, restrictions are drafted uh, they were uh, drafted vis-a-vis -vis either um, what the characteristic of the use is uh, and um, not really zone specific if you will um, we think this is a unique parcel. It's roughly 13 acres. Uh, it's one of the largest parcels that's undeveloped in the town center. And um, what we found in kind of parsing through these regulations, which are difficult at, at best to say, is that uh, we were limited with respect to the sizes. So uh, it, it, I, if you read my materials, you may not pick up that there's one kind of critical element to the distinction between the two buildings, which is that um, the uh, the nursing facility and or the assisted living facility, which is with respect to our first variance request, um, is uh, 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 is a variance that relates to bedrooms not units. So when we talk about the numbers for that facility, we're talking about bedrooms. There could be two bedrooms uh, in one unit. Um, we're not talking about units. So that's a different distinction. Than I'm sorry, when, can I interrupt you? Yeah. When you're saying 62 bedrooms, there could be two beds in each of, you said bedrooms, there could be Bed two beds in each of the bedrooms. Is that what you're indicating? No, what, what I'm saying is that these are bedrooms and not the, the, the metric of units. When we talk about the 55 and older, then those restrictions relate to number of units. So I just wanted to clarify that, make sure it's one, an- One is dwelling units, the other one is bedrooms. Yeah. Oh, so I understand bed. that, but when you say 62 bedrooms, you could potentially have 124 clients, correct? Uh, I mean, that's not our That's intention. not our intent. Our intention is, is one person per unit. Oh. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. One person per bed. Per bed. Okay. Per bed. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So again, what I highlighted in my footnote to my materials is that there seems to only be a distinction whether you're calling yourself a nursing facility or an elder assisted care home as to whether or not you provide 24 hour nursing service. Um, we didn't want to limit this application to one or the other. Uh, because we needed that flexibility in terms of how this is ultimately built out. So we're basically asking for the most restricted um, uh, requirement with respect to that. So these are all kind of uh, uh, very, uh, uh, I'll say, interesting uh, provisions because you kind of have to bounce around the code to get to the right answers. But um, with um, Mr. Hawkins' help, uh, we were able to do that. And so we're invoking uh, mostly the footnotes that are in your uh, table of uses uh, because these uses relate to triggering those uh, footnotes. So for the nursing facility and or elderly assisted care uh, facility, uh, we are looking uh, for uh, 47 bedrooms uh, in a, uh, to get to a total of 62, where either 29, if you're looking at one footnote, is permitted, or 15 is permitted. So we're using the 15 because that would be uh, the most conservative way to look at it and ask you for relief. So I'm sorry that that's a little convoluted, but that's the way the footnotes kind of point to us. With respect to the second variance, we're looking uh, for uh, 25 additional units, uh, where seven are permitted. And if you can imagine um, um, our surprise when we find that um, the density is calculated at 40,000 uh, per square feet for, for two units, that gets us, uh, in terms of the uplands, that gets us to uh, only seven permitted units in a 55 and older. So uh, obviously, I that's fairly restrictive. Um, and and one of the things that I thought was interesting again, and I, I think I mentioned it in the beginning, is that if if we took 
the parking calculations that are separate from this in terms of what we're trying to do in terms of density, we would be able to put all that parking on this site. And I think that illustrates how appropriate this site is for the uses that we're trying to utilize. Again, that metric of how many parking spaces would you need is overblown uh, because basically in the uh, system, excuse me, in the nursing facility, you're really not going to use going to use 10% of those spaces. Um, these uh, uh, people who are the clients of that facility, one of the objectives is in essence to stop them from driving uh, and uh, to protect them. Uh, so we think that um, you have to kind of keep that in mind that even though the site supports that, um, we're not using that. And, um, and we think that's an important way of looking at this project. The um, the other issue that we wanted to kind of address up front was uh, we fully expect, obviously, if we get approval from you tonight to go to the planning board, planning board will vet this project, including uh, not only the parking, but the access. And, um, you know, at this point, we're showing a plan that has four points of access. Um, they're clearly going to be looking at that issue. The public is going to be able to look at how we uh, address that. They're going to have experts with respect to traffic uh, counts and consultants, um, but the planning board will uh, obviously be able to address those concerns. And again, if you look at the major uses in terms of uh, uh, these these uh, facilities, they're close to the entrance point to 125 um, and Route 9 and uh, uh, obviously, there is uh, access on Malego Road as well. Um, but in any event, um, what I'd like to do is. Um, no, I'm going to just go through the criteria for the variance, and then I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hopkins to come up and give you a little bit of sense of um, why this is, uh, seems appropriate to him uh, and give him, him a, a chance to. Uh, listen to those uh, points that he has to make. So as you move through the criteria for mm -hmm. the variance, are you suggesting that the criteria you're proposing applies to both yes. of the variances or all four of yes. the um, variances notice, requested? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I am. Um, your application starts with the hardship, so I'll do that. Um, the unnecessary hardship. Um, and um, again, I too will not read the whole criteria for the for that, but it does start with um, the special conditions existing um, and what the rationale and relationship is between the restrictions, which is the density issue, um, and whether or not you know, they really are required to be uh, applied or is it unnecessary in this case? And that's the way I look at this uh, test is the, the hardship is that uh, we need the density to be feasible. We need the density to provide for an opportunity for uh, uh, healthcare professionals to be at the assisted living building. And we can't do that with um, 15 uh, beds. We can't have those kind of professionals providing those services. Uh, again, if you go back to what I uh, provided in my materials, um, we're we're looking at um, geriatric care, medical assistance, hospice, gym, exercise, and nutrition programs. Again, those things that can be available to the to the other building, 55 and older, but they cost money and not they, but they cost people power. And in order to make that feasible, we have to have uh, more than the uh, limit that's allowed. And and it would be unnecessary in this instance. Uh, given the buffering that we have, but also given the size of the lot, which is really unique in this situation, to limit these facilities just to those numbers. And that's why we believe there is uh, an unnecessary hardship and that there is no connection uh, or general um, uh, relationship between that restriction and restricting this particular building uh, and these uses to that density uh, in order to protect any general intent of the ordinance 
uh, the ordinance will those those uh, that intent will be protected in this instance. Uh, again, there's if you know the area and you saw our pictures, there's a large amount of buffering that goes on. It's a perfect location for uh, the residents to be there. It's a perfect location for existing residents of Barrington to utilize this facility. They close by, they can stay within their community uh, or they can stay just next door to their spouse. Uh, so for all of those reasons, we believe there's an unnecessary hardship and that we meet that criteria. Uh, we repeat that. Uh, Paul, did you ask for that to be repeated or did someone else? I left them them. Yeah. No, I did not. OK, someone on someone who's observing the meeting um, stated something. I'm sorry, continue. OK, thank you very much. So we do think that that applies uh, to the density issue, which kind of triggers the two or if you say four because there's all these different footnotes. So uh, those requirements. Um, the uh, next test is whether this uh, the granting of the variances would be consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. And um, I think I'll just start by saying this is again breathing to life the original intent of what the town center was looking to provide. We're here for a variance of density for these two buildings. We're not looking for a variance with respect to the other uses, um, but Oops. those uh, uses will be obviously limited to that area, but this project will open up this area to the general public. Um, we show tennis courts, pickleball courts, uh, bandstand, but those that area is going to be dedicated to public use. And um, again, as I said, we understand that the town is excited about that. Uh, we're looking to provide it. It again dovetails completely with what we're trying to provide in terms of on-site uh, residential use. But again, it's limited residential use. It's limited to the assisted living. Uh, and it's limited to the 55 and older uh, facility. So we think that comes together. Uh, so we clearly think that uh, this is consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. This is what the ordinance is trying to provide. At one point, it was trying to provide seven buildings of senior housing. Uh, we're, we're focused on what we're asking for, and we think it's consistent with that, the spirit of the ordinance. Uh, the third test is the whether the granting of the variance will result in the diminution of surrounding property values. And um, this is uh, to start. This is in the town center. Um, and you know the the intent of the town center uh, district is to provide a high density of commercial development, civic uses and public open spaces and uh, alternative housing concepts within the community. Uh, we're we're doing exactly what uh, anyone would do um, in terms of providing that. What, what, what we're really doing at the same time is providing um, that alternative housing. Um, but what we're not providing is what is also available to be done on this parcel. Again, this is 13 acres. Uh, that 13 acres, we could put a billiard this, without any restriction, a building par a billiard parlor, bowling alleys, a brewery. A gasoline station, grocery store, hotels, and restaurants with drive-throughs. We could also put churches and uh, schools. Those are very intense uses, and that's the distinction here. Is even though we're asking for a density variance, our use, our intensity, and the intensity that it reflects upon the community is going to be less than what 13 acres of all of those uses would produce. So if there's an issue of traffic, this is the best plan that anyone could see in an area. And that's why, given that the zoning encompasses those types of uses, uh, we don't see this plan as diminishing the property values. Um, and uh, again, it's because of that less intense use. Um, the fourth test is that whether those variances will do substantial justice and you are aware that this is a balancing balancing test between whether the benefit to the applicants outweighs the burden to the public. 
uh, for the reason that I've suggested. I, I think this is not a burden to the public at all. This is a benefit to the public. It's going to open up that area for public use. Um, it's going to create uses that are vitally necessary uh, for the town of Barrington in terms of the elder care uh, that uh, when you listen to uh, Mr. Hopkins, you'll understand those other resources that Barrington residents could utilize are being stretched uh, to the max and maybe not even available at this point. Um, so we, we believe that uh, there's no negative aspect to this to the town. And we believe that uh, uh, substantial justice would be done in terms of allowing the uh, uh, density increase in order to provide this kind of service uh, to this area and to the and to the town. Whether the granting of the variance would uh, not be contrary to the public interest, um, this uh, uh, again we've submitted this as a reasonable use. Um, the the uh, specific needs uh, of the town center district are going to be uh, addressed and accomplished. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the test uh, legally is whether this alters the essential character of the locality uh, or does uh, uh, harm. Uh, and uh, if you know that area, which I'm sure you all do, uh, you know that it's heavily buffered. Uh, and if this is an area where those kinds of uses that I described are going to be put, um, then the essential character of that community is going to be made up of those uses at some point. This is not going to alter that. In fact, this is going to uh, uh, fit in in a way that is less obtrusive than all of those other types of uses that could be utilized. Um, it's 13 acres uh, of a of a site that's going to you know, have very. Uh, uh, very low impact in terms of its uses uh, to the area. And uh, again, we're going to go through full site plan review. We're expecting that the planning board is going to look at any issues with respect to traffic, um, but I think they're going to find um, that it's going to be pleasing to them. Uh, I think I mentioned if I didn't, we went to them on October 4th. Uh, to do a preliminary cons uh, consultation. And uh, I think this project was received, received well. I think comments that said, you know, this really links up with what our intent or what the intent was, uh, that it was very complimentary to that. And so I think that was, um, uh, you know, but something we wanted to make sure that we passed that test. And I think we did uh, in front of the planning board. So those are um, the uh, uh, issues with respect to the uh, uh, five criteria. And um, I think what I'd like to do is ask uh, Mr. Hopkins to come up and just give you his sense of his experience and a little taste of his expertise. So I yield to him. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the board, citizens of Barrington. I hope you can hear me. I'll try to give you a crash course in geriatrics with a couple of disclaimers and transparency. Transparency and full disclosure, number one, I have no financial interest in this project. Transparency, number two. Uh, Dan Gabriel sold me two pieces of land which became Bellamy Fields and Watson Fields 10 and 12 years ago. Uh, I went through the planning and zoning boards in Dover successfully, and I have two uh, 50, 55 bed facilities operating now, and I've taken care of over a thousand people, uh, one of whom I'm going to talk about because I asked her at the time for her permission uh, little did I know, uh, but that I would tell people her story someday. The, the short story of my history is I'm a doctor of public health. 
and you all now know what public health is the hard way. Uh, Dr. Fauci and I foisted on you the worst epidemic in a hundred years, and it came to Bellamy Fields. And I saw what it did to geriatrics. I now understand as a scientist why the elderly were uh, so affected by the COVID virus and what has become of us with vaccines and booster shots. And I'm now proud to say again, as a scientist and a grandfather, my seven month old got a COVID shot recently. Um, pros and cons, it's not a political statement. It's simply a scientific one. My history in New Hampshire is thanks to Don Shumway, who was the uh, Health and Human Services uh, director in the state for years, Secretary of Health and Human Services. He saw geriatrics coming. He invited uh, a friend of his who was a friend of mine to come to Frisbee Hospital in 1984. And then they gave me a floor of the hospital to invent geriatric psychiatry. If any of you knew Vince Noble at the time, he was quite a character. Uh, after 20 years at Frisbee Hospital, uh, I went into the assisted living business, uh, having taken care of my dying parents. I'm an only child, so it was the right thing to do. And as a consequence of my father, who was dying, saying to me, why, why, is, the end of my, why is the end of my life not like the middle? Uh, he was in a nursing home. He was wearing somebody else's pajamas. He was in pain because he had lymphoma, but it hadn't been four hours, so he couldn't have any more medicine. So I'm, I'm here as a product of that. Uh, along the way, uh, I've been president of the Seacoast Hospice Board. Some of you may know the Hyder Family Hospice House. The Hyder brothers were kind enough to give us a check for a million dollars back in the day to build the Hyder House, which didn't turn out to be what I had hoped it to be. And I was also the president of the Board of Compass Care in Portsmouth, which is an Alzheimer's Day Care and a Senior Citizen Center. Around 2008, unbeknownst to us, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which some of you who are business people will remember better than I, blew up the endowments of not-for-profits like Compass Care and the Seacoast Hospice. Uh, I was the signatory which sold the Hyder House to Emeticist, or actually Beacon Hospice, which in turn was selling itself to Emeticist, which in turn already had a deal to throw in the keys. I was hoping that Wentworth Douglas would go into the hospice business. Uh, they didn't. They had their own financial issues at the time. So that's the, the quick background of the, the pleasure that I have had since 1984. Prior to that, I was in the Veterans Administration, and my background in, in psychiatry and public health led me to develop Bellamy and Watson Fields for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and end-of-life care. The end of life care story, which is poignant for this time of year, I would say this is health care of Christmas past. Uh, Arlene Califf died at Bellamy Fields. She came to me uh, soon after I opened the facility. She was had gone to the hospital. And again, I have her permission to tell the story. She, her kidneys were failing. She went on dialysis. She moved into a nursing home. But she said to me, I'm only on dialysis because I, I want to live to see my great granddaughter born. When that happens, I'm going to take myself off dialysis and you're going to tell me that's OK. And I thought, whoa, what a formidable woman. Uh, her great granddaughter was born <clears throat> one Saturday morning. They called me and said, Arlene won't get on the bus. She said she's quitting dialysis today. I, I said, as now is the cliche, you go, girl. And uh, she. She was in control of her own destiny. Uh, that's the pitch I'm making for the town center project as far as healthcare goes. That's the past of healthcare. If any of you, you're, you're in the center of the healthcare universe here because a little bit west of here, you've got Concord Hospital. To the south, you've got Exeter. To the east, you've got Portsmouth. To the north, you've got Wentworth Douglas. I'm sorry to say as a political comment of sorts, I don't know what's gonna happen to Frisbee. But if any of you have used a community hospital lately, they're struggling. They're having a very hard time. Uh, the viruses, the emergency rooms, uh, everybody's in the same boat. If you read the globe, you know, that's all you see. You can't staff it. Nobody knows what's coming. Uh, I can tell you what's coming if you support a project like this, that public health, geriatrics, nursing, and medicine, Christmas future of geriatric healthcare is a nurse with a backpack 
with a stethoscope with good Wi-Fi, and she would be able to see you on the first, second, or third floor. As I'll speak to the density issue uh, in a moment also. But this is only the same, part of the same size as Bellamy and Watson. So speaking from experience, this is not a massive number of people. But today, uh, if we were in business and your grandmother had a junky cough, our nurse would put a stethoscope on her. Uh, if she didn't like what she heard, the nurse practitioner would order a chest X-ray. You wouldn't go to the emergency room for the, the chest X-ray. The chest X-ray travels. The chest X-ray comes to you. Somewhere in the netherworld, a radiologist will read the chest X-ray and, and she will say left lower lobe pneumonia. The nurse practitioner who works for us would say, OK, Leviquin, uh, 500 twice a day for 10 days. Uh, it'll be delivered tonight from the pharmacy that services the town center of healthcare. We would treat pneumonia today without having you go to the emergency room. And we would treat you effectively and you would be asleep in your own bed instead of somebody else's. And the way things are going in community care, the elderly who are becoming increasingly immune compromised, as would have been the case with Mrs. Caleb's kidney failure, uh, the, the hospital is actually not a good place to be. I'm, I'm going to mention, I'll call it the 15 and 50 rule. 15% 15 of the population are my age, which is geriatrics on Medicare. We use 50% of the hospital beds in America. I'm guessing that when you implement public health geriatrics on a project scope like this, probably two thirds of that will go away. The people who are in the emergency room at Wentworth Douglas tonight, uh, and then this is going to get more complicated, are not going to be admitted to the med surge floors. They're going to be turned around. They're going to be given an antibiotic. If this project is developed and you lived in one of the cottages, you might move into what I would call the infirmary, or if you were in the Navy, sick bay. Uh, instead of going to the hospital, you would go from the cottage into the infirmary. And if you were dehydrated, as elderly people get, and when they have pneumonia, you would get your IV antibiotic, you would get rehydrated, you would be in sick bay for a couple of days, and you'd be home for Christmas. That's the future of Christmas future. It's public health geriatrics. It will tie in nicely with the training that the university is doing across a number of dimensions. Right now, I train the high school kids at Dover High School uh, for LNA. The Career Tech Center uses uh, Watson Fields for about 25 people a year. That's the next generation of healthcare. I train nurses from Great Bay in psychiatric nursing and also in hospice. But the future of healthcare can come to town center. You don't have to go out to get it. Uh, it it's my pleasure to describe what we've done to this point and to offer you a vision, which would be to say, in summary, I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. I'm here to tune the car. It's already in place. Uh, it, it works. The size of the density, lastly, is that the industry standard, because of having to pay high school kids uh, a wage that competes with McDonald's and nurses aides who are going to $20 an hour, whether you like it or not, and LPNs and RNs who are going to 30, 35, 45, 50 dollars an hour. The, the scope that these gentlemen are proposing to go to 64 beds is absolutely essential. Because you've got housekeeping and maintenance and laundry and you've got a large infrastructure, not a lot of people, but it's 24 7 365. And, and anything less than the number of beds they're proposing is probably not a viable business model. So I know the healthcare works. I hope you can understand the need for them to get to this level in order to get to the style of care. And lastly, I, I've known Dan as a good steward of the land. If you've been to Bellamy or Watson Fields, you'll see what pretty properties they are. Uh, they're on the Bellamy, they're on the Pacheco. The, uh, the notion that, that this is going to be a monstrosity and obstruct uh, the beauty of the parcel uh, it just isn't going to happen. This is not a hard project to do on the size of the land that you're talking about, and it'll bring great value and quality of life to the elders of Barrington. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. 
I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I know that in reviewing the Bellamy Fields and Watson that you have subscribed to a model where two patients or two clients are residing in a room for their socialization. And I'm wondering if that is dictated by just your programming model or if the state of New Hampshire and your licensing model decides how many clients to a room or how many you may serve at your facility? Yes, ma'am. Personal, uh, professional view. I believe if you have Alzheimer's, and I'll be a little vulgar, when you're losing your mind, two heads are better than one. So I pitch families for having roommates. I, I put uh, veterans together. I put Red Sox fans together. Occasionally, I put Republicans and Democrats together. They, they, they don't do well together. But the, the roommates model for me, uh, since there is no cure for Alzheimer's coming, uh, being with another live person uh, to me has added value. Uh, the ladies make great roommates. The guys are a little harder to buddy up, but that's that's my choice based on my belief system of the diseases. Mm -hmm. And then um, should this variance be approved, what would stand in the way of taking 62 bedrooms and making it 124 clients or patients? This may call for that may be above my grade level, but when if we were to apply for beds in the state of New Hampshire today, from the healthcare perspective, I have to go through the Bureau of Health Facilities and ask for a license which sets the number of beds. So that that's determined by a separate licensure process. Uh, health safety, life safety. I get two surveys a year from the state, and again, in the interest of disclosure, because I own these properties, I they're not full. I, I won't fill them if I can't staff them. But uh, the 804, 805 are the levels of licensure that the Bureau of Health Facilities uh, in Concord regulates. So way down the road, you have to apply. You have to apply for a license to operate beds a certain way if they're going to be licensed as assisted living. Okay. Are your two facilities on city water and sewer in Dover? Yes. Okay. And are, may I ask, do you operate a for-profit or not-for-profit model? Uh, until the pandemic came along, I was a for-profit business. <laughs> He's still for-profit. He's not I, making I, a profit. I, I understand that. <laughs> I, I, I hope to be so someday. Again. I pays full taxes, yes. I understand. Okay. Um, and I, I'll ask you, Mr. Gabriel, do you have the intention of building a facility and selling it? We have the capability, um, Mr. Meter, who's here, owns Budell Construction. Um, we have the capability and we have the financing to do it. Um, my hopes are to be able to first get through tonight and then find somebody like John or somebody in the field first to see if they have if they have an interest in doing it. So, I can't you say an interest in doing an interest in obtaining the facility after it's built. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or they or they might have their own builder. A friend like Riverwoods has their own builder. Mm. They wouldn't have us build it. Okay. So we have the capability of doing it. I'm getting along in age and I don't know if I have enough expertise in that area. So I'm going to rely upon the professionals yeah. to do that. Okay. Uh, it's a really it's a it's a large request. Um, yeah. Frisbee is under VHF allowed 119 beds. They operate 80, and that's a very large facility. Mm -hmm. Potentially here with 62 rooms, you're talking 124 clients. That's that's a rather robust um, we facility. We um, I, I know John doubles people up. I wouldn't have an issue with you limiting the amount of patients to 64. So if we double it, that would allow other rooms for other purposes. And can I ask, um, is there a reason that you're not full at this current time? My relationship with Dan over the years, my interest in geriatrics and just this year, uh, we were sort of reunited with his reaching out 
uh, as he does every couple of years, you know, how's it going? What's going on? We we did all those things. So I was then, thinking more of a supply and demand perspective. You mentioned that Bellamy and Watson were not completely full. I think you mentioned staffing issues. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I, I don't operate beds that I can't uh, staff safely. Okay. Uh, I have a waiting list. Okay. Okay. That's helpful for me. Um, does anyone else on the board have questions? I, I jump do. right in. Please. Um, please. We're probably not on it yet. And that, well, maybe I need to. We're, we're still on the first variance, right? Well, they combined. So okay. um, I'm going to try and pronounce your name. But so I'll say FX. FX. Okay. Yeah. So um, you used the criteria for both variances. Okay. So you can ask in reference to either. Okay. I'm looking at the um, 55 and older housing. And I'm just, my question is what is to prevent or to ensure that that? Houses only 55 and older people. Could that be 65 and older? That would be closer to the geriatrics, I would believe. I mean, the, so the 65 and older um, sets forth a lot of additional criteria that we may not be able to meet. For instance, programming in the building that just puts more staff that in that facility. The traditional way of limiting. Uh, uh, the uh, age restriction and to still be legal under the Fair Housing Act is to utilize the 55 and older restriction. Um, most towns who adopt an elderly ordinance call it the 55 and older ordinance for a reason because the 65 and older provision that does exist requires so much programming that those projects never get built. Or rarely get the yeah, there say are never. Some, there's one in Concord. Right, I shouldn't say never, because it's not saying or say, or but, or but it's very uncommon and it's very um, inordinate and it doesn't um, really become practical in terms of it doesn't come to fruition. Um, so that's why towns use that 55 and older. You'll see that in many ordinances. So we can rest assured that in a 55 and older, a 55 and older um, independent living, there wouldn't be someone's son or daughter move in with their three kids. The uh, provisions would allow for that because someone has to be 55 and older, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question for you, sir. Yes. On the 55 and older, well, I want to go back to that. Yeah. Um, what does the Fair Housing Act require that the person 55 years of age or older live in the home as a percentage of time during the year? They assume that they live there 100 percent of the. I'll say I'm, I'm, I'm primary residence. Is yeah, as a primary residence. I mean, I, I if they went away for a couple of weeks, I'm sure they're OK, but it's a primary residence status. It would be someone who's 55 and older, so you wouldn't want and the the or the statute wouldn't protect someone who's 55 and older buying it and then renting it out to a bunch of college kids or something like that. No, understood. But but the 55 year older person, as you just said, could, um, for instance, go south for the winter. And as long as they retain their Barrington address as their primary. Um, I, I can't be specific in that legal answer, but I, I'm very, very close to being 100 percent sure that's the case. Mm. Right. And can I just say one thing? We we purposely made it 55 because that's what the vision statement said. It's all over it. It's like 55 is all over that document, not another number. So and and I think there is a, a synergy, as I explained, between a couple. And I because yeah, I, I had this conversation with John earlier, a couple finding themselves in that position where someone wants to be or can be in the uh, independent living. Um, but have a spouse who's in that assisted living. Uh, that happens more than we think because we, I'm 55 and older too, never think that we're going to be in this position until we see a family member in it, which uh, John's helped my family as well. But uh, so in any event, that was one of the synergies that we are relying upon as well in terms of the size of the 55 being utilized for that as well as people in Barrington wanting to stay in Barrington, that old traditional, where's the 55 and older housing in Barrington? Well, it could be right here, and it could be here to help a lot of people who are living in Barrington who want to downsize but want to stay in Barrington, and then want to stay in the town center where they can walk to the post office, 
They can walk to a medical office building. They can be near their grandchildren at the school. This is where that could happen. And this would be the benefit, that would be a benefit to this town because I don't think there are a lot of places that are available. And this could be that one. Vice Chair Bailey, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, we get back to that 55 and over, mm -hmm. and you say they have them there. Is that going to be uh, uh, in line with the uh, income that they have, or is it going to no. be? It, it, thank you on that from there. I have some more. Yes, certainly. My, my other question is that when we talked about, you talked about the town center mm -hmm. and having uh, several courts and everything else. Uh, I, I, I personally envision turning around and making reservations and everything else. And so if, you, if your clientele that live there, that your, your paying customers live there, mm -hmm. that would forego any space for uh, Barrington residents to come there. Is that correct? You no, know, the, ma the management of those public areas are yeah. run by the recreation. That's department. right. They would set the bookings of time. We have nothing to do with that. Yeah, the, it would just be other, they would then be other Barrington Road residents. They would have no priority with respect to those other facilities right. that are on that. Plan. And if the rec department decided that they didn't want to do that, well, then how would you how would you handle those? The, the way the town center is set up and the PUD specifically as well, is that you provide for these spaces for the town to take that role and the town. So the town created this situation. And by the way, we've had discussions and the town and the rec department are excited about those possibilities. So I think it will uh, come, you know, it will be come come to life the way the town envisioned when they created that provision. I appreciate the information because the rec department didn't share it with me. Uh, Vice Chair Bailey is also on our select board, so he would actually be one of the five deciding how the budget plays out for any of those but, facilities you mentioned. Yeah, but, but also you'd be involved with guiding how this would e evolve, you know, because you you as the uh, the town created the ordinance that said, <clears throat> give us this area to play with. We would keep it and, you know, probably put a park there or something. We're not looking for more density. If we didn't have that provision, we were saying to the town, OK, you go do what you want with it. And so that's what we're doing. We're doing exactly what the ordinance and that's said. That's what that chip thing is that the town is bringing forward. Bring it forward. Yeah. The reason I bring that up to you is because back in uh, 2003, I believe I was on the uh, select board, I turned around and set up a program that you would have elderly housing where Turbo Cam now sets. Mm -hmm. And thinking I was all set with that, I took the family, went to Disney. Down, spent a lot of time in Disney, came back, and I was the one that was business because they turned around and said, no, we're not going to make this come forward and set it up for elderly housing. So that's why I have a lot of concern. I think that it's there. Now that I'm at that age, well, I'm going to, you know. Fed well, the, the best part about what you just said is that what we're doing is we're proposing this mm -hmm. use. So that's really a condition of your approval is that that's what we're going to do. Yeah. We're not going to take the 55 and older and then all of a sudden scrap that idea and make it something else. As I know, you must be aware of there are certain medical facilities in the around this town that are uh, set up for uh, everybody and what have you. And so with that in mind, how would you, as, uh, as it was stated, elderly care for uh, uh, non-residents like a, uh, would it be like a medical office for the uh, res non well, there non residents? Is, there is a medical. Would they be able to share in uh, what you provide? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Dan talk to how that in, that vision is. If you, well, the plan's over there, but if you look in the upper left-hand corner of the plan, there's a 5,000 square foot medical right. office. We would, we would, that would be an independent doctor and he would see the whole town. He's not, right. it, that is not, who are you? If we have medical staff in the building, they're dedicated to the people in the building. Mm -hmm. So it's separate. And, and my, my last question to you is that when you talked about uh, uh, I must get this correct because I, I don't like a legal challenge. Please. Bypass. Okay. Um, quick question. How would you ensure that Barrington residents were given priority both in the assisted living environment and in the housing? 
I don't think I suggested they get priority, but it's certainly available to them. Um, I don't know that we could enforce that or that the town could, but what we do and when I look at this is I look at the geography and where it is. And um, my brother who died at 45 of brain cancer was under the care of John and his facility. And, and we needed that to be local. We could have gone somewhere else with his end of life care. And we decided to go virtually down the road. And I would think that if this facility is in Barrington, you have now opened up that possibility to everyone in Barrington. Would someone in Rochester apply and be admitted? <laughs> Why not? Of course. Um, but we're not asking you to judge this application on that criteria. But I think it's uh, it's fair to say that and rational to say that that's how this will work. And it was for my family when my brother brother-in-law passed away. Uh, I went to John because he was literally there. Uh, I could have gone somewhere else. We didn't. So I think that's how it will work. Barrington's an interesting community. We're 12.8% 65 and older and 10.9% those living with disabilities. We tend to actually be a, a relatively young community with still mm. growing educational um, numbers in our schools. So yeah. we, we're, we're interested in that regard. Um, any other questions? Still yeah, yeah. Um, First of all, uh, I really appreciate your opening statement, Mr. Gabriel, and I, I don't doubt your sincerity. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, I would love to have a lunch with you to discuss uh, some of your, uh, but it doesn't play a role in this, but I appreciate you caring so much for the elderly. It's, it's becoming a bigger part of the population. And uh, me being one of those, I do appreciate it sincerely. Um, and this is a big change for the town, uh, obviously. And uh, I have a, a, a just it's just a huge scope of things. Uh, can I ask at this point how what is the sequence you would do to open this whole 13 parcel, 13 acre parcel? Have you, have you thought about that? I just wanted to get through tonight first. Um, we have. I would think that it would take us a year to get through engineering. Um, you know, traffic surveys, uh, planning department. I'm sure there'll be numerous meetings at the planning department. So I don't see at the earliest this wouldn't start till 2024. At the earliest. And uh, how long would you think it would be to do in its entirety? In its entirety? Yeah. Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball about the economy. <laughs> I don't know. No, we all. Um, you know, I think I think the daycare facility, uh, from what I understand, and I think there might even be people here tonight that might know more about daycare in, the, in, in Barrington, but there was a long waiting list. I think the daycare will probably go very quick. The medical office, the hospital's buying up doctors everywhere and they're putting them all in the hospital. So we've got to find somebody that's willing to practice outside of that environment. I don't know how long that'll take. But that would be a wish to be able to get a family practice there that is going to service the community. As a as a uh, senior citizen, I wish you were putting in a drugstore as well, especially since the limiting hours that are occurring. Uh, but if we cut the bar. parking down, we might have room for a drugstore. <laughs> well, my next question actually is for parking. So yeah. um, the parking that you stated, is that adequate for people who are going to visit? of the, these uh, the elderly residents there. Um, what are your experiences with parking? Uh, once again, over a, a thousand lives uh, served uh, for a, a decade or 12 years. At, at this time, all, among all of my residents, nobody drives. We, we have the touchy subject that I take more time. I hope this doesn't sound vulgar. I, I take away people's licenses. I don't give them. Uh, my my people who have Alzheimer's who are poor drivers. So long story short, the the number of residents of the healthcare cottages or the assisted living facilities are going to decrease statistically and knowingly in the rate that, that they operate automobiles. Glaucoma, cataracts, neuropathy, dementia, uh, they decline for driving. The the ratio I was going to 
pitch, and, and I suspect you know what it is in schools, is that when when you get elders, it, it's still a little bit elusive. But my 104 year old guest at Bellamy Fields doesn't have a lot of friends anymore. She's got some family. Sure. So without beating around the bush for you, uh, the the number of visitors of the elderly tend to be family members because the other 85 year olds aren't driving, et cetera. So the the rate of visitors tends to be related only to the number of family who are driving and then earlier the, the staffing of people coming and going. Uh, my biggest concern with all this is um, the Malago Road uh, issue and the amount of construction that's going to be occurring and the, the amount of equipment that's going to be in and out of there. Have you thought about how you can relieve that issue for these residents on them. They use Malego Road, and it, it, there's no doubt that it's used. I use it because I have a post office box, so right. I use it all the time, and I'm a little bit concerned personally as right. well. But I know that a lot of residents in the area are concerned about that too. Would, uh, so how would you, how would you be able to alleviate uh, that situation? You're talking about the construction period. For uh, now, period. yeah, just the construction. Um, certainly. You know, the planning board could direct and, and, and dedicate an entrance for construction vehicles and we can post that. That's one way we can address that. Um, I don't think there's a property in Barrington that has access in four areas. So what we intend to do is the next step would be to have a traffic engineer make his proposal, make the best use of the property, address that concern for construction. And then when we go to the planning board, the planning board would have the ultimate decision. The planning board could say, everything comes in off of 125. If that's the case, and obviously the state has to go along with that because it's a state highway, then we, we're good with that. There might not be any traffic on Lego Road. So we have no, uh, you know, as developers of the site, we have no request as to how many or where those entrances are. You people decide. But it's also a concern for Route 9, too, obviously. Yes, that, that, which also is, would require a state approval as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, just one last thing. Under number five, granting variance would not be contrary to public interest. Uh, it, it says, as such, the proposed use will not be contrary to public interest, that the use will not alter the essential character of the locality. Yeah. It certainly will, in my opinion, alter that. And you've got to judge the benefit of doing it versus. I'm not doing it, and and I appreciate what you're trying to do, but but um, Can you I, know how people coming from the Malego area, Malego Road area, uh, walking and how how do they access that? You, you know what? It, I, the I safety concerns that. are the issue. My uh, last issue that I want to bring up, as yeah. well as it does change. Yeah. So. Okay. Just to kind of put it in the context of we're, what we're here for is only with respect to the increase in density for these two buildings. I understand that. Right. So what we've offered is that with the buffering that we we're going to have in place, the density relates to mass and that's not going to alter the essential character because it's going to be buffered by that view. But at the same time, something is going to go on these 13 acres that's uh, permitted use in the town center. So something is coming and with respect to this project and the increased density, is it going to alter the characteristic with respect to what the permitted uses are? And our argument is no, it's not. In fact, it's going to be a diminished use with respect to what could be permitted. And I think we've illustrated that. And, and I think it's common sense that when you have an assisted living facility that has a group of people that are not mobile, um, that density, that difference, and we could have a smaller one, that density isn't going to alter the, the characteristic of this community as it is now zoned as a town center zone. One last quick question. People who want to access the tennis courts, the bocce court, all of those things, yeah. where are they going to park? Please? Well, the town has parking has separate it's 20 i think 24 spaces on that proposed plan right for for parking 24 spaces yes, yes. in that area as well as the town does have 
uh, the parking lot in that area as well. On the corner uh, by, is it Elf's? The, the, I think the, the, the that town. new gravel area that was put in. Yeah. It, it's actually the town pulls an easement from the state. And that's why in that area it could actually be expanded more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's going to be under control of the town as well. So those. The town decides it wants 30. They've got the room for it. So. Yeah. So for, for the sake of time, we're at 844 right now, and we have not heard any uh, right, testimony sure. against the project. And no, no, you've asked excellent questions. Anyone else on the board have questions that they would like to ask? Okay. okay. Any more questions for you, sir? Talked about the elephant in this project and its money. Talked about that. And you have alluded on numerous occasions, the increase that you're asking for in the variances. Mm -hmm. How much of an effort does that play into what you're seeking, sir? Well, the project, from our perspective, and and talking to uh, 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 John, John uh, is how do we make it feasible? How do we make it work? That's the word. Yeah. Ooh. And, Feasible uh, does employ imply that you have to have a certain amount of income to provide the kind of services that this kind of facility will require. So, in a in a sense, that plays a role for the size of how we've come to this size is related to how can we service this entity. Well, I don't. Okay. Can I, let, me answer, let me answer in plain English. If we had to build a building of 29, we would not do this project. There will be something else in front of you. It will not be enough. Of the yeah, oh, I, I understand that. I just wanted to uh, find out the definition of density when they were using it under the hardship part. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Madam Chair, thank you. Okay. I am going to. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Chair yes. I have a couple questions if you don't mind. Oh, go right ahead. Um, for people in the audience who wish to speak against the variants, please stick around. As soon as um, Mr. Thibodeau is done, we're going to do a quick bio break, and then we'll have you present. Um, please go ahead with your questions, Mr. Thibodeau. Um, so a lot of the conversation has evolved around assistant living, um, the elderly, um, nursing, and so on. And then we're talking about a large amount of these units being 55 and older. So obviously a person 55 or older does not have to be disabled in order to qualify to rent one of these units. Is that correct? That's correct. In, okay. In, in the, in one of the buildings. Yes. Yes. Okay. So my, my point is this, and Mr. Gabriel, I, I agree that your presentation was very eloquent when you spoke about your conversation with Mrs. Califf, and it sounds like she was at the age where she was really missing the care that she would have liked to have and remain in Barrington, and she certainly was over 55 years of age. So my question is, or more, more of a comment, these units will be occupied by people 55 and older, they're working, they have families, they're producing income, they're driving cars, um, they're living a normal life. They are not disabled. So now we have a person that comes along that is say 62 years of age or older, which is one of the Fair Housing Act's uses that can be restricted to 62 years of age or older, and you don't have any place for them. There's no place it's because all of these 55 healthy people are in there working, living, working, and there's no space for that person that it sounds like you're trying to create a living space for. So how do you justify allowing someone in their working years, 55, to reside here when you have someone who is disabled, but there's no space left for them? 
Yeah. I think that's an excellent question, and we've talked about this. Can I ask the audience not that this is super, it's super difficult for anyone to hear the hearing online if they're talking. Go ahead, sir. I think the way we're going to approach it um, is that this building is tied in some fashion to the other building and the fact that there may be services to this building, such as uh, an Uber driver available to take them to doctor's appointments or take them somewhere. I said Uber driver, but it could be a private individual hired by the major facility. Um, there's going to be dining options available to the people in the independent that don't want to cook anymore and they want to, and that helps support the staff of being able to cook and so forth. I think that the tie of these two buildings will make it not attractive to somebody that has a family and, and is, is younger. That's my own personal opinion. If, if the, have you, have you thought about what a unit like this would, would rent for it? So I'm speaking to affordability. So a family comes in, there's 155 or older member, and of course their family is allowed to stay there. If it's affordable enough, they will come. Um, and again, it will push this disabled person who could use the services, but there's no space left for them. 62 years. Have you thought about restricting this to 62 years of age or older, which is what the Fair Housing Act allows as one of the exceptions? Is that a question to me or to FX? Yeah, well, I, I, I think I can speak to it that um, that uh, again, that 62 and older, and I misspoke, I said 65 and older, and then 62 um, does also require um, additional uh, services and uh, facilities that are not part of the 55 and older. Um, that's why, again, I think we had that conversation that it's it's very unique and I'll say rare almost to see that kind of facility created, um, whether it has more density or not because of those restrictions and requirements. Um, but we're here tonight looking for that, um, that density with respect to what is more typical in terms of that age restricted housing. And I think Dan's comments are, are pretty, important to consider in that regard because the kind of uh, even though we can't under your ordinance connect the building physically because then it's one building um, we see an integration with the two buildings working together and I think it I think he's right that uh, it's not going to be very attractive to a, a, a couple with a family particularly if we're limiting um, I think we're limiting the bedroom count yeah, and the other point is, is I think, uh, Paul, by law, you can only have a maximum of 20% of younger folks living in a 55 and older building. And that would be 20% of 32 units. Uh, so what is that? That's six, six. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be attractive to a family to move into this building. What's the consequence if the 55 or older person moves out and the family's left behind. What, what happens with that family? Well, the the requirement is that it has to be uh, one person 55 and older has to be in 80% of the units, which I think is exactly what Dan was just describing. I understand, but how do you monitor that? And I'm not trying to be argumentative. I can just see with all yeah. of these units and and people coming and going, and now the 55-year-old leaves this unit, uh, the abutters enables them though, but how does this, who enforces this? And, and do they well, actually go over and, and tell these folks, you're getting an eviction notice, you're, you're no longer qualified to be here. Your family is not 55, you have no one here to represent that age group. A project of this size typically would have an on-site manager, so it'd be very hard to do something uh, without without recognizing what's it, happening. Plus, these people will be signing leases, right? And they'd be breaking the lease if they if somebody else moved in and we didn't know about it. So that's a good point. They'd be signing leases, and the lease would, in effect, require the 55-year-old person to be there. 
Yeah. And if that ceased to happen, then they would have to vacate. Right. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions, Ms. Thibodeau? Go ahead. Thank you. Are you okay, um, Ms. Suckins, this is going to be our last group of questions. It's, it's then... just, a, just a, a general question. Um, I have a friend whose parents were getting elderly and they decided to sell their house and they bought, which is kind of unusual, a, in this facility, they had available condos or cottages. They bought a cottage in this facility and the facility also had an assisted living nursing home type care and they the goal was to live here among your peers and then eventually when you're ill or you get older you progress that's what we to. expected yeah mm -hmm. and so i was wondering if you consider doing that and turning the 32 units into condos that we haven't thought of that um i mean that that could be a, that could be an option. I think under New Hampshire law, you could make a condo out of a building like that. I don't know like where that. this facility is. I can ask her. She used to actually work with us. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it worked out for both her parents because one of them got very ill and moved into the, the nursing facility. He passed and the mother still had her place until she yeah. got ill. The, and then the, the downside is with respect to um, what was previously asked is when you provide ownership of that unit, you lose some of the power. You're not down to lease now and you're not able to adjust or move or remove, yeah. you know, when abuses start. So yeah, you know, there's a there's a double edge to that. Well there was there was definitely a lot of restrictions. Right. Right. Oversight that could do them. Yeah, yeah, she was they were yeah. very restricted. Okay. Um any yeah. any other questions before we move to it? Yes, sir. Motion to adjourn for seven minutes. Motion to adjourn for seven minutes, and when we return, we'll be hearing those opposed to the variance. Or in favor. Or in favor. Oh, or I'm sorry. Or in favor. I, you're right. I should make that assumption. My apologies, men. Okay. How many restaurants are you down this Two of the restaurants are right up in the hallway there. And it's, yeah, so we'll be able to have like a computer.
I can sniff out food and you might still be on your thing too. Maybe. I can sniff out food. Hi, sir. Come back. Um, anyone that would like to speak on behalf of the project and the variance, please raise your hand. We'll have you come to the podium. Come up. Yeah. yeah. Well, state your name, please, and your address where you reside here in Barrington. My name is Jackie Lambert. Uh, I live just across from George Kalis. My address is 30 Malago Road. Um, first, I'm going to state that I'm not necessarily opposed to the use that's proposed for this. I think it all hangs together pretty well. But I do have some questions, some concerns. Um, there is going to be a large number of people utilizing these, this property. Uh, what provision has been made for water and sewage? Um, the house that I live in uh, has water with a dug well. Okay. And there's a little pond behind my place which can't be developed. Um, what's going to happen with the water table once wells or whatever it is that's being used starts working? There's no city water or sewer anywhere in Barrington. What's going to happen with the sewage that's generated? Um, I don't know if there's any provision made for that, but I'm concerned about is that going to pollute the groundwater and my well? Um, so I'm very concerned about that. And I'd like to have some answers as to whether that's been been considered. And then I have a couple of other questions. Well, first I'll share with you there is uh, before the select board, which will um, I assume be coming for the residents of the town of Barrington, something called and I'll, uh, Mr. Bailey could speak better to this. It's a little off topic, but there is a TIF, TIF, um, Finesse Line Major. TIF district. Yeah. That has nothing to do with water and sewer. Well, it, it kind of does. It, it clusters commercial development in a way that has less of an impact on water usage. Um, so, good question. I'm not sure that this variance speaks to that. This variance well, speaks to at, at the planning density. At the planning board, they can address those questions. I, I understand that what we're yeah. talking about here is the variance. Yes. But before I say yay or nay on the variance, I'd like to know how these things are going to affect what decisions I'm going to express. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I feel uh, people feel the same way. Yeah. And since I'm, I'm going to be a very close neighbor to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I think I really deserve to have some information. I I think honestly, as part of the engineering of the project, is yeah. when the water and sewer are addressed. So well, that's this, nice, but that yeah. will only take place once the variance is granted. I I absolutely hear you. Yeah. I do. The other thing is too, and I had not thought about it, uh, but although we were told that somebody else at some other time would decide where the entrances and exits are for this development, mm -hmm. it's pretty plain from looking at this that it's going to be at least one on Malago Road. Yep. Okay. Now Malago is used by a lot of kids who drive their bikes back and forth, a lot of people who walk their dogs, or a lot of people who just walk it recreationally. And Malago is a very residential area. Um, once the traffic starts coming in and out of that, wherever it's located, whether it's on one side of Georgia or on another one, that's going to change how Malago Road, the entire length of Malago Road actually, is going to be affected. And so that's an important thing too, is don't tell me that there isn't going to be something coming out, going in and out of Malago Road. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also in connection with that, uh, one thing that was brought up was the construction period. Mm -hmm. The construction that size is probably going to take maybe about a year. Okay. It's bad enough that there is going to be this change that would take place, but to have construction stuff going back and forth on Malago Road for a year, um, that just doesn't cut it. Um, 
there Three. anything else that you wanted to speak to? I've written down notes that you've spoken in reference to water, sewer, traffic, the change to the actual usage by yeah. pedestrians and bikers on Malago, and um, that you've addressed the issue of construction. The, one other thing, and then maybe nobody is even concerned about that, and probably nobody gives a hoot, but from my house, right now when I look across the street or down the street, it's dark except for the two couple of lights on the post office, which used to be very bright and now they're more yellow, so it's very moderated. Light pollution now with all of this, all those parking spaces are gonna be lit up all the time. Okay, they don't shut parking, parking lights, uh, parking lot lights at night. So the light pollution means that now, my whole neighborhood is gonna be looking at those lights. And even though there's a buffer, you still see through that, especially in the winter time when there are no leaves on the trees. So it, this changes the character of, of our neighborhood completely. Um, I know it affects 125 area more than that, but you know we're, we're all affected on Malago Road. And a lot of people, because they weren't direct abutters, didn't get the notice, um, but became aware of it after the fact. Um, so anyway, I'm the first one to talk, but Okay. Um, this, what before I can say yes or no on whether I would go with this variance and whether it even makes any difference. Um, I just You're thought finished. I should say what I have to say and, and let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak? Please, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since I'm addressing the board rather than the audience, can I turn this around? So, so sure. when I refer to the plan, yeah. you'll know what I'm talking about. Certainly. My name is George Caleb. I live in this square right here. It's not Malago, it's Malago. I'll start here since I- started right thinking here. I was pronouncing yeah. it wrong for 22 years. <laughs> this is my law, but on there, it says 50 foot residential buffer. Buffer belongs down here, not my lawn. That little circle is my lawn. That's not a buffer. That's my property, and the buffer is down here. There is no buffer between the road and my property. Very little buffer between the road and my property on the other side. Setback in the rear, um, I'm not sure what that is, it might be 10 feet, 5 feet. I don't really see how that meets the setback. Um, I apologize, Dan, when I first saw the plan, I didn't bring these to your attention, um, but I didn't, couldn't read the print on the little one you gave me. Um, very concerned about water and septic. I didn't see any septic on the plan. No water on there? Is it, was it? Complete, except that it's being complete with no septic shown on the plan. Uh, Mr. Califf, I'm going to let Vanessa speak to this. We have been told that the ZBA is too well, too well yeah. radius. George, wait a minute, Sir, please. We have been told. Um, now my turn to talk? No, no just, I just, just wanted give us to let you know, know, just, just one minute. to the sewer and the wells. We have been, I'll let Vanessa speak to this. Um, sir, just to let you know, this is a conceptual plan to just show you the layout of it too. So this has not gone, be, it's only gone for the planning board for a conceptual review, which is non-binding to get comments back from the planning board. They have not gone forward for the planning board for their right. formal application. How can so we the speak placement for, of the well. the variance without the information we need to make a decision? Right, so the variance is for the density. It doesn't address the wells or the access at this time um, that goes through the planning board process that's just for everybody not just directed at you to ever let everybody know um they still have to go through the planning board through this process um not that your comments here aren't valid or not being heard but they're the board here is just looking strictly at the density of the project versus the necessary the entirety of the project because that's where the planning board when it goes when they do their formal application um well, I actually too. saw this as a bit of a curveball in the first place. Normally, you go to the planning board and get the plan, and then you ask for the variance. Um, so they went to the, yeah, the planning board to get a conceptual um, 
review, which means that notifies from the buyer is not notified because it's a non binding action with the board to see if there's things that they should look at. And um, during before they submit a formal design, so they don't have to. Thank you. you, you I really liked the idea of having something available in Barrington. Um, I can relate to that probably more than anybody in the room. My wife has been in a nursing home for about three years. Um, I don't think anybody's going to stay there any longer than they, they have to because it costs a ton of money. But the density I like is also out. limited by. I really like density. the idea of a sidewalk. I'm one of the ones that you can see walking up and down the road with a little white dog. It gets me going, and it's good for both of us. But I'll tell you, you take your life in your hands doing it now. We've got school traffic coming out down here that never was supposed to happen. Originally, that school was built or proposed with no entrance. And the reason I'm bringing up school in this is it's side by side. It, the school traffic contributes a lot here. Anyway, that the school plan was shot down three times until they moved the entrance from Malago to 125. Then all of a sudden, we have to have an emergency entrance. And then it's buses, an emergency. And then the gates open 24 hours a day. And the principal told me one day, I got 400 cars coming out of here. Kids picking up their, their work to bring home. It's open to all comers now. And it's extremely dangerous to walk on the road. There's no way to get off. Um, there's no enforcement whatsoever of either the emergency exit or speed on that road. Um, I've mentioned it, but they choose not to. To enforce the uh, emergency exit only. Um, as far as locating the sidewalk, I'm a little concerned about that. I'm not sure how wide the right of way is. Um, it's a very nice road now. It's been regraded. The shoulders are in some places three feet deep. So if you step off, you're done. That's all going to have to be built or something's going to be very costly. But having served six years on the board myself, and what happened down a village place, the sidewalk I don't think is going to make it. It's going to get negotiated out. I don't want to see that happen. The sidewalk's on the plan. This is the plan you want. Do it. But water, septic, traffic, need a different buffer than what I see here. But thank you. Um, the concept is great. So I've, I've just so you know that I've heard you. I've written down the, the buffer, <laughs> the water, the septic, traffic increase, the sidewalks, and speed on the road. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Um, the woman behind you had her hand up first. Will you please state your name and your address when you come to the podium? Sure. <laughs> hmm. My name is Geraldine Hubbard, and I live on Ivy Lane in Barrington, and I am for the project. Um, and the reason I'm going to tell you why I'm for the project is it has a lot to offer. Our health care is changing, and we're, the clientele is changing, and our 55-year-old community being in here doesn't mean that the 55 will be in all of it, because you've got independent and assisted living. <laughs> independent, they have to meet which by the state is called a RAT. Sorry, it's called a RAT, but it's a resident assessment tool. And that lets you know where they're qualified to be, whether they're qualified to be an independent or assisted living. It's a quality of life. It's where they can continue to grow and be and be in their own community and be able to give back into the community and financially also help a project that is a wonderful project. And I've been in the healthcare for a long time. Parents are getting older and it also is an opportunity for a respite program where a lot of people have their families still home and they love their family very much they want to get away what a great opportunity to bring somebody in here for respite and be able to stay and have the care that they need and be able to go on have a wonderful vacation and not worry about their loved ones i see a lot day in day out like i said i've been into healthcare for many years um, and the clientele is changing we're not seeing the 80 and 90 year olds anymore. We're seeing the 50 and 60 year olds. So this kind of a project will keep them in where they still can be involved in things 
that they're going to be paying a certain price to be there. So the tennis courts and whatever is in here will be included. So the public coming in, doing it, they're paying taxes into the town as these people are paying to stay in here. So there should not be any charge for anybody to come in and do the same thing. Who's ever in a, in assisted or in, in independent living, nine times out of 10 wouldn't be 55 years old. They have to be qualified to be in those, in that uh, level of care. And they can continue to grow to be the level of care from the time they start to the time that, yes, they do get into nursing homes. We, in our nursing home, we need more veteran nursing homes. This is an opportunity for people to stay here and we can take in more veterans in our nursing homes. So I think it's a great project. I know it's got a lot of work to go um, and there's a lot to work out of it, but I think it's a great project for the town and brings in a, us for our community to help our community and that they can stay because there is a lot of places they're not, um, they're closing their doors and we need this. It's a generation that's coming and we'll all be there someday. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm already there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else would like to speak? Someone right here? Hear me? Yes. My name is Brian Dubois. I live at 42 Malibu Road. My house is right here in front of one of the proposed uh, entrances. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a real estate appraiser. I have been since 1989. Um, I am also a broker uh, and deal in all sorts of properties. The <coughs> One problem with this is th that you have to address is how will it affect uh, a butter's property's value? So this is a conceptual, it can change. So you can't say that it won't affect value. You won't know until you have an actual plan that's being submitted. So my point is, is that you can't say that it's not affecting value because you don't know what it's going to be. Um, that is a, a strong issue with me. And the road going from 125 to Malagora Road is, um, it's, it's an issue because of what other people have uh, already addressed. The, um, the comment that uh, Mrs. Lambert had about the well and septic, that is a question for the planning board, but the, the project itself could actually impact her value if she has to put in a new well or um, I don't know about the septic, but it would be more about the, about the well itself uh, if the well gets contaminated or if um, if it dries up. So that's even though that's a question for the planning board, you still have to kind of uh, look at that impact on the values. Um, so again, you don't know uh, until uh, until you have an actual plan that's that's before us uh, to tell what's going to happen with value. Uh, a little bit more. I know Dan personally, stand up guy. Um, and uh, as far as the proposal, I, I kind of agree with everybody else. You know, something you know should be done. Um, at what density? You know, I don't know. Um, and then the last thing. Uh, was um, yeah, there was one other thing, but I, I, I can't think what it is. So um, I've, I've listed your points as the water to the surrounding properties, potential for decrease in home values and traffic. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yep, thanks. Would anyone else please start in the back? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may go first. Yes. Before he speaks, there are people online that I see that your hands are raised, and there's several people online that would probably like to speak for or against. I do. We do see you. We're going to first hear from the audience here that's present, and then we will go to online. Thank you for your patience. You'd state your name and your address, please. My name's John Duby. I live at 82 Malago, which is about four or five properties down. Um, Re-echoing what some of the people here say, the traffic. 
Uh, one of the things I heard tonight was that the probably the first thing that would come up would be the daycare. Uh, on that plan, it says 84 children. There's drop off and pick up right away. Malago Road is already being used as a cut through road. People don't want to wait at the light. They cut, come down from the far end of Malago Road and either cut down Tate or come down through. Um, any increase in the density of traffic in that area is just going to make that, uh, it's going to exacerbate that. Uh, one of the other things that uh, came up tonight was that um, he's going to be looking for somebody to take over the property once it's there. And I would be concerned that whatever variance may be granted here um, may not stick to the people that are would take that over. And I don't know whether yes. there's any protection or things like that that would, you know, be, but that's one of the concerns that I have tonight, as well as, as the, the well. I mean, we had concerns last year when the drought was happening, whether, you know, we we're going to have enough water at our particular place and to have this kind of a draw uh, on the aquifer and in, in, in this area uh, is a great concern. Um, so those those things there um, are, are <coughs> big. I, I don't have an objection to the thing and I and I do understand what they're saying about the density. Um, but. You know, the rights of the people that are already here should have a bearing on whether or not something like that is allowed to come in. Um, there's a shortage of these types of, of facilities right now. Um, so if this were to be put up, what what is to stop all the people from Portsmouth and Dover and surrounding area that right now can't find a place and having this thing fill up right away and then the people in Barrington don't have access to it. So um, those are my concerns. Would you like to, I, I assume Jen is your spouse. Yes. Would you like to read her letter into record while you're up there? Sure. I'm comfortable doing that again? Yes. Yeah, Thank that you. would be most helpful. We were going to do it, but I'm losing my voice fast. So. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, this is for our zoning board and town planning folks. Uh, my name is Jennifer Duby. It's actually my wife. My husband and John and I lived at 82 Malaga Road for 12 years. We chose Barrington specifically because of its small town feel and the natural beauty of this immediate area. Our main concerns regarding the proposed Caleb Halley Malago Road project involve the potential significant increase of traffic as well as the impact such a project will have on the wetlands around us. We have already seen greatly increased traffic from the elementary school. The decision was made several years ago to allow buses only to use the Malago Road gate during drop off pickup times, but that gate is now accessible all day to anyone and everyone. Malago was already a popular cut through between routes 9 and 125, and it's reasonably concerned that adding new facilities, 282 parking spaces adjacent to a busy elementary school could exacerbate access and safety issues on our road. In addition, in our neighborhood, there are currently a limited but appropriate number of private wells, drainage areas, and septic systems. Could the physical needs of the proposed facilities have a negative impact on a water table, which is currently serving a much smaller population? I estimate roughly 120 toilets and sinks, perhaps 80 to 100 tub shower units, greatly increased laundry heat, landscape watering, etc. Compounding this concern, it seems that concentrated expanse paved areas could affect not only natural drainage options, but the road salt runoff could impact our groundwater and natural wetlands in this area. Town maps will show that there's a natural bog situated between Malago Road and Pine, Pine Grove Cemetery. On one of the plans, there's a tiny note notation indicating man-made wetlands. This is something I would guess would occur when natural drainage options are eliminated or greatly decreased. If we are already planning for a man-made wetland, then perhaps this deserves a closer look. Drainage issues at the other end of Malago, no, Malago are well known and have been ongoing for years. Any wetland study performed in 2022 will likely not provide accurate data due to the unprecedented drought in New Hampshire and New England last year. Indeed, throughout the entire Northeast. Even prior to 2022, we are all aware that New Hampshire's water levels have been affected by the ongoing lack of precipitation. When we finally do receive adequate rain and, and snowfall in the years ahead, exactly where will that water be draining to? We have not had swampy areas on Malago Road, nor would this be desirable, but as noted above, there are long, long standing drainage issues. Barrington does have pressing needs for quality childcare as well as good options for senior living. There has been a huge increase in construction of all types over the last few years. I would be interesting to know, say over the past 10 years, how many variances have been requested for each of those years and how many of them have been granted. 
ironically, my I'll skip that one. <laughs> when I was personal. <laughs> thank you for your time and thank you, especially for the service to our town. Thank you. <laughs> Can I put that back so that my records? Thank you, sir. Who else would like to speak? Please. Please state your name and address. Jim Fordham, uh, 98 Mendham's Landing Road in Barrington. Um, I, it's getting late. Uh, I think this is a very exciting project and I'm in favor of it, but I also appreciate the investigation that you guys are doing. I'll just leave it at that. I mean, healthcare is a mess these days and to have for folks to have an opportunity not to have to spend a day in, a, in, in, in you know, in the emergency room unnecessarily is, something that's a wonderful thing. That's okay. it. Thank you. Is there anyone else physically here that would like to speak? If not, I'm going to move to online, please. I'm sorry. Can I hold you off one second? Go ahead, Ms. Hawkins. Well, I just wanted to say something in the, in, in, with regard to everyone worrying about amount of water. Um, I, I believe this must still be true. I was working for the town way back when we had a water bottling company that wanted to come here and there was extensive research done on our water. And at that time, I was told that the aquifer that runs under 125 is enormous. I would um, I would say that, you know, water, I mean, sewer naturally would be a concern. But um, the last thing I would worry about is water availability in that area. So I repeat, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, your name, please, and your address. Yes, I have a couple things just to mention. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ben Bradley, and I live at 210 Malago Road. Uh, same road that everybody's spoken of. Uh, I want to voice support for the plan. Uh, my parents are getting older and I think it would be a good plan for Barrington. Uh, additionally, uh, I work at Wentworth Douglas Hospital and I can't speak on their behalf. Uh, things that I voice are my own and shouldn't be construed to be attributed to the hospital. Um, but I know the hospital does a uh, community health needs assessment every three years as part of their nonprofit mission. And among the things that may be top of mind around mental health, behavioral health, uh, and other issues at the very top of the list of those is access to long term care. This plan is a well thought out plan that I think uh, balances the needs in our community with a thoughtful approach for some town space. Uh, additionally, I would say my biggest concern with this process is the zoning board would get caught up in things outside of its responsibility and decline to move this process forward where other issues that I appreciate from neighbors can be sorted out. So I would ask uh, the board to Consider this on its merit for your job of re reviewing the variances that are being proposed and allow the planning board and other processes to move forward uh, without objection from this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Anyone else that would like to speak, please come up to the podium. My name is Melanie Ross and I live at 227 Malago Road. I think the plan is great. I know we need these services and whatnot, but my biggest problem is the water and the traffic. You say that we have a great aquifer. I tend to disagree when we run out of water because we run the washing machine too many times in the day. Um, so, and they're building 15 houses out behind us now. That's going to take up more water. And then you build this here. That's going to take a lot more water. We won't have any water at all. It's it's just not right. It's not fair for us people that live there. I've lived there for 27 years. And we're going to be run out. Because of overpopulating. Overdeveloping. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak? Can we go to the online hands raised, please? Yes, um, I have anybody online that would like to raise their hand or comment. I do see a hand up. Um, if 
I'll unmute you. I think it. Um, I think you might have to unmute yourself if you're online. That you have your Hi. hand up. Thank you. Can you? Hi, this is Dawn Castle, oh, that's not... 14 Red Fox Lane. And, um, you know, really an advocate for senior housing, spent my career advocating for older Americans and access to equitable health care. But share a lot of the concerns of my neighbors. I pass Mr. Caleb almost every day walking his dog and understand the challenges of traffic on the road as well as the issue with sewer and water access. But one of the things that I, I have a question on today uh, that wasn't really clear in all the comments as they were talking about the uh, variance and actual occupancy of what's being proposed is, and if I missed it, my apologies, what is the number of units of this project that's proposed versus the actual licensing that will be requested from the state of New Hampshire? for occupancy of these buildings. So I don't know so if someone can answer John, that. Yeah, can you pa pause for one second? Because I think this speaks directly to the variance of density being requested. So um, it sounds to me like the question that's before us, and I would, as um, a board member, be interested in this. You stated the number of units, but let's talk about the occupancy of each of the two. OK. That would be one, yes. Right. Um, you have the paperwork. Yeah. Okay. I'll let that fix it. So we have 32 housing units in the senior housing, and you expect the occupant number to be. The 32 units, from my understanding, and talking to code enforcement, um, those are individual apartments. Those apartments could have a maximum of two bedrooms. So and so, right? Yeah, and that um, variance is measured by units, not by bedrooms. So it's kind of, that's right. the kind of juxtaposition of the ordinance itself is the nursing facility, if you are assisted living, is uh, measured by bedrooms and the uh, 55 and older is measured by. So, so the importance rooms. of that is I think you won't find a family with three kids or even two kids because the kids, if they're boy and girl, need to have the separate bedroom. So in in the case of having people that are connected to the other unit, a spouse, it may be one occupant, uh, but we don't anticipate more than two occupants at the max per apartment. And, and I think you're doing two bedroom, bedroom units. Two like bedroom units. Yeah, so but I think that can answer it, that person's uh, issue and maybe the board's as well. Dan had indicated that even though it might be common practice other in other facilities to allow two people per bedroom with respect to the nursing facility, he's, and it's uh, 62 units. So, I thought 64. No, it's 62. 62 bedrooms looking and, and agreeing to a restriction with respect to one person per bedroom. So, so that would be, again, completely inconsistent with, you know, I guess, so, standard practice. So. So, the, so the assisted living environment yes. or skilled nursing care environment, the occupancy is 62. 62. And so then when if we had a yeah. husband and wife, it comes out of that number. OK. So in other words, is we'd have to then have an empty unit that would be utilized for something else. And the housing with the 32 units would be 64 people potentially in two bedroom units. But it could be as high as 96. No. no well, the two children and an adult. You know, well, no, because you'd never have all of them occupied by children. Uh, uh, in the 55 and older, only we're talking about that. Yeah. Okay. So I, I could ask my question in a different way. Sure. So I want to make, I want to make the distinction be between a skilled nursing facility which is what we know is a nursing home, which uh, has a different level of care, different services provided than an assisted living and the various levels of care that may happen within assisted living. So within the independent living, it's my understanding those are just regular apartments. So people can rent them 
There's no care associated with it. There's no cost of care associated with it. It's like if I just went and rented an apartment, how many units are you proposing for the independent living? 32. 32. The variance is requesting 32. Yeah. And, and can I speak okay. to that just since we're on that yeah. page? Yeah. The allowable number of units for that building could be, either, depending on what footnote you're in, either seven or eight. So it was interesting, the question that one of the board members asked is, what if those units are filled up right away by uh, uh, either persons that are, you know, healthy, 55 years and old or whatever? If we don't get the variance, that the likelihood is that that happens quicker as opposed to later. So we're asking you to make it easier for those 55 and older who are disabled to have a place to even think about. If you grant, if you deny the variance, we're only limited to either seven or eight, let's say seven. We understand. Yeah, and and so I think that's important distinction as well to make. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, I understand. And then with the assisted living units, how many units are you proposing and how many licensed beds are you proposing within those units? 62 units and 62 licensed beds. But what's the pro what's the probability of you having 62 units um, that can have two people that you're going to expand that licensure to double that occupancy? We're, we're limiting our request in front of this board to that uh, level. So, so that's what's so if just a variance be granted, it would be with the caveat that those 62 units would only allow for single occupancy. Correct. Yeah, you granted okay. for 62 beds. 62 beds. Okay. Right, we granted for 62 beds. Yeah. Any other questions, Dawn? Uh, yes, one other one, and, and I don't know if this is the right form, so please, if it's not. I'm curious, Dr. Hopkins, um, you know, I know uh, owns Watkins and Bellamy. What is the average rent? in uh, if he can share that, because I'm trying to understand access versus equity and I, serving bearing to residents. I will just share with you that that's not valid to the request for the variance. So I would be okay. uncomfortable. Um, we're talking about a density issue and you're talking about a profitability issue and I would be uncomfortable yeah. even, even entertaining okay. that, Don. That's fine. Thank you. There. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Um, there is a, another individual mine on Swin Castles. Um, I can't unmute you. You have your hand raised. So if you have the SC that's got their hand raised. Yeah. Okay. I can't. Can someone on screen with the initials SC, and I apologize that I sound like I'm, I'm losing my voice. Uh, <laughs> if you could, if you'd like to that speak, was, are you there? That was. Okay. Yes, that was me. Before, before you speak for the respect. So for the respect of everyone else here in the room and online, I think that we have a very good picture of the support and certainly um, the concerns in reference to the density variance. If there's another factoid, fact, issue, Statistics, something that you'd like to bring forward, please do. If not, I would like to, to speed things along and potentially go ahead. There was one last thing quickly uh, yes. from my perspective that I'm concerned about, and that Stage is and Ben Bradley, 210 yeah. Malago Road. Yeah. I had spoken before. Um, the one other thing that I just want this board to consider is this plan is coming before you, but it's because it's required to asking for a variance. And I think it was alluded to in what the presenters had talked about, which is if this isn't granted, it's likely not going to happen because it's not feasible. I think that's an important point. However, the other point is you've got 13 viable acres that a plan could be put forth that maybe isn't as advantageous to the community needs uh, that that are outlined, you know, in various community community needs assessments. So. You know, you could ha you could end up with a Coles or a gas station or a you know whatever else outside of this. And I, you know, I think the presenter is genuine in his interest in meeting the needs of the community. But my concern is you you oppose this, you prevent the planning board from addressing some of those other concerns, 
and uh, you know a developer could come in and, and do something within the guidelines that exist in town center zoning. Um, and so that's why I think I'm so passionate about this project is I, I think you actually heard from a number of people that the concept is they like. Uh, and I'd hate for it to move in the wrong direction just because they couldn't get through a, a variance request. So thanks so much. Thank you for sharing that. So I stated that in the terms of the unknown of what else could occur on the property. Go ahead, Vice Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, we have a book of instructions that we're required to follow. Who gave us those? The voters of this town gave them to us for us to follow. And there are leeways in it to allow us to have some exceptions to the way it's written. But mostly it's voters like yourself that have put this forward and said, this is what we want and this is what we don't want. Well, that's that's the guidelines maybe that we are going to have to go by. And I know it's it, it persistent. I think um, I would just... Um, our zoning administrator has pointed out, and I just wanted to read this, but maximum density for New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, subsurface disposal regulations, or no more than one bedroom per 10,000 square feet of upland soil, um, or the most restrictive requirement falls in place. In other words, there are requirements for the septic systems that will go before these properties to ensure that whatever is placed there is appropriate. And it might be the density would be less than what was granted if that's what and, DES loan and, and that was one of the final points I wanted to make as well is that when we go through the process of the planning board um, and, and we have looked at water tables and we have looked at um, uh, drainage and uh, although we talked about wetlands and salt and all that, all of that is self-contained on any site, and this is 13 acres, so there's going to be a lot of possibilities in terms of 21st century treatment of that that doesn't exist in a lot of projects that are older. Um, this will be state-of-the-art designing, and the planning board will make sure that happens. But what was just pointed out is also important. It, if there are restrictions that are imposed by you, the planning board, and or the state with respect to limits, then irrespective of what you grant, we're going to still have to abide by those rules as well. And we fully expect that. And we just hope that we can provide as much as we can uh, in terms of what we are trying to propose for the community. Thank you. Um, before we entertain any motion, a variance is a waiver or a relaxation of particular requirements of an ordinance, and in this case, the zoning ordinance, when strict enforcement would cause undue hardship because the circumstance is unique to the property. So uh, I would like you to keep in mind, we've been presented with what are in fact four aspects of, the, of, of a variance and all of them involve density or usage of the property. We've been presented with facts, both from the public and from the um, applicant in this particular case. And um, our job as a quasi-judicial board is to entertain non-opinion and facts that have been presented to us. So based on that, do I have a motion from any of the board members one way or the other regarding the variance? I'd like to close public comment. Oh, certainly at this time we'll close public comment. I'm sorry. That's the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. sorry. At 946. Yes, sorry. You're all bringing in there. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion by any of our board? Oh, wait. I think, Paul, I think you're. you I heard you say. <laughs> I heard you say I want to make a motion, but. I I'm did. Did you less. hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Go ahead, Thank Mr. Chibita. All right. I like I love the concept of this this whole plan, uh, the daycare, the the 55 and older, the older community being served. But the density for this 13 acre parcel is too much, in my opinion. It's just too many. It's a it's a big it's a huge ask. I mean, you're, you're asking for 25 additional units. Um, 
and the additional beds that you're asking for, four times the density. It's just too much of an ask for this 13 acre parcel. And I have to agree with a lot of the comments about the congestion on the road, Malgo in particular, and coming out onto Route 9 and taking a, trying to take a right on Route 9 from Malgo in the first place. Now you add all of these, the daycare folks dropping their kids off and the traffic from this facility going in and out. My God, I don't, I don't see how you're going to... And I know that's the planning board's, board's job, but again, if we allow the variance tonight then the planning board has to deal with that. Um, so before them will be, okay, how are we going to get there? They've, they've been approved to have this. This density has been approved by the ZBA. How are they going to get there? So you're going to have to come up with the plans to go in and out of this facility and with a flow of traffic that is not going to totally change the, the, whole, the whole character of 125 Route 9 Malaga Road it's already getting congested in there in the morning. It's it's doable as it is, but I think with this many units and the units that are proposed across the street and the units that just went down on Route 9, there's like 50 of them there or something, I think the density is too much of an ask. If it was smaller, I could support it. I, I love the idea. I really do. I just think there's too much. So do you have a it's, motion, Mr. Thibodeau? I have a motion that we deny the application as proposed. Do I have a first or a second? You can't make a second? negative. Do not make a negative motion. So, um, if you are to decline the variance, you need to state your reasons for declining the variance. Or if you get a motion. Right now, if we don't get a motion, it does not pass. So we cannot. We cannot have a negative. Well, I'm pretty sure that legal said that we need to actually decline and give reasons. And you have to give a reason. You have to give a reason. Okay. Yeah. All right. So a motion to decline. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. So at this okay. time, be ready if we take a vote. Um, I think you should state the reason before you yeah. vote because you've got to give a reason. Okay. So My reasons are in the hardship, hardship density in it, and because of the dollar value of not making enough money. The way, the way that I feel that it is written, I think that is part of it. And also the other one there is public interest. I think the public uh, interest, and it's going to change the way that section of the world is, or that section of the way Barrington is. That's the reasons why I turned it down. An interruption in... Yeah. Um, your, you have to state your reasons, Paul, for declining the... Well, yeah. as long as one person states it, it's not an emotion. Then. It's denying it due to the. You already said why. That's uh, there. But answer. you have to say why by one of the five criteria. Yeah. I think George just <laughs> did it for me. <laughs> so you have the same uh, reasons for declining. Okay. Um, roll call. Are you still vote? waiting for me to do that? Well, um, I was. Waiting to see if you had another issue. Um, I have an issue with the density. I have an issue with the traffic. So a, a reason based on the qualifications might be that the land is able to be utilized in another capacity so that it does not meet the requirement of a hardship. You've got to base it on the five criteria, Paul. <laughs> you have to base it on the criteria that was brought before you. All right, good grief. George, have at it. Well, I did, and I, I, I made those uh, comments there, mm -hmm. and I really feel that uh, it's it's. I've made my thing. Hardship and pub and uh, uh, public uh, comment with it for the uh, public in interest. Okay. You know, it's uh, it's going to change, and I am doing a dance here for one reason. It's right here. The grant, granting the variance would be contrary to public interest, period. That's the thing. Because I can't use the negative. So we have 
I, That's right. I the understand. New Supreme Court changed. I know. It, and, uh, it's it's yeah. very, very difficult. Makes it difficult. All these years. In the other room? He was stating the uh, five. It, the yeah. water supply issue, I think, he okay. mentioned, and there's a hardship for the neighbors. It's a hardship because of the, because they they, they, they use the hardship saying that they did. They, yeah. So I have a first and I have a second for declining the variance. Could I have a roll call vote, please? Paul, I'll start with you because you're online. Aye. Okay. I hate to say maybe because I love this project, but I can't see hardship here, so I have to say. So I just want to be clear. Andre voted nay, which means that he is for the project. If you vote for the project, then you are a nay. If you are voting against the project based on the motion, so which are you choosing? Um, I have to. I have to go. I and I just don't see a hardship. Okay. Aside from that, I love this project. Yeah. Hey, Leo. Um. So to be very upfront and honest, the the my reason for voting I is that the land can be utilized in other capacity. We all love this project. The density you're requesting is a little over the top. The land could be utilized in other ways, which means that the hardship for you that you've proposed does not actually exist, which ties our hands to approving this much of a density. So I also vote on. So that's four to one and you denied the variance. That is I would correct. Just take exception to what you said is that's the old standards in terms of reasonable use, but I understand what your vote is. Uh, oh, uh, we, uh, I think we quite honestly made clear that if the numbers were not quite as high as what has been presented to us, we would all. No, I, I completely understand. What okay. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that's a governor's yeah. island rationale that you're using, which I would object to. But other than that, I understand the vote. Okay. I appreciate your time. And I, it was well. a pleasure meeting you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming.